Ben. And I'm Jen. Uh, this is uh, Philosophy Friday. Hey, Jay Andrew. Um, so this is actually the uh, the last uh, Philosophy Friday in its current form. Uh, so there are some big format changes uh, coming up. Um, I'll still be around. Don't you worry. But uh, you will still be able to talk, see me and Jen talk about philosophy every week. Uh, just uh, just not in the form that we're doing it right now on, on Fridays. Uh, so uh, what we thought we'd do for this last one is that uh, we would uh, just do it as a philosophy Q&A. So uh, whatever you guys uh, out there want to talk about, uh, hit us up in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, no politics. It's Philosophy Friday. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, as far as philosophy goes, you know, ask away. Uh, we reserve the right to answer ooh, you know, for, <laughs> for, for some of the questions. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but, you know, but anything else, you know, go, uh, go nuts. Um, and, you know, or if it's, you know, not exactly philosophy, too. I mean, I'll, you know, no promises will answer everything, but, you know, you can ask anything you want. All right. You can ask personal questions. I'll answer. <laughs> well, Ben's like, shh. <laughs> yeah, we sometimes have different ideas about privacy. <laughs> but, uh, See, the thing is, I know that Ben is a, privacy is a bigger deal to him than it is to me. But I don't always understand that, like, item X <laughs> is a private item. So I'm like, Ben, I'm not saying anything that's, that's private. He's like, no, item X is private. And then I'm like. Why? <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, I'll, it'll it'll be like the the attorney sitting with the client. <laughs> <laughs> Can I answer that? <laughs> All right, got a couple already. Uh, Daris uh, says that I'm trying to be better at reading these aloud uh, for people who are like in the other room washing dishes or something while the video is on in the background. I feel for you if you're washing dishes. Um. So Dara says, at what grade level should the basics of philosophy first be taught? That's fine. Oh, it depends on what you mean by the basics of philosophy. That's true, I, too. I would say. Like uh, critical thinking, soon as they pop out the womb, <laughs> baby. Should, um, should, should be with the baby. You should be doing little fallacy flashcards. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I guess that it depends on on what you're you're talking about. Critical thinking, I think, yeah, um, soon as possible. Other stuff, hmm. high school. I mean, I think so. Sorry if I'm sure. Go nuts. Is uh, you know, in English classes in high school, they have us read all this stuff that we can't appreciate because mm -hmm. we're in high school. And then when you get older and you read it, then you're like, oh, that's what's so great about this. Oh, that's what this is supposed to say. So it's kind of wasted on the young. And I think philosophy, you know, you, know, you don't want that to be the case either, that it's just kind of wasted and people are like, you know, this is boring. Why would I ever want to revisit this later in life kind of thing? Yeah, maybe. Uh, so I think... Um... I don't know. I wonder if that might be more true of, of literature than philosophy. Like, in other words, like maybe part of the reason that high school students, uh, other than any who watch the show, who are the smartest people in the world, but uh, part of the reason why some high school students uh, don't get much out of some of the literature that they're assigned in English classes is because there are certain things, maybe emotionally, that you appreciate more with life experience Whereas, like, I don't so know. you know more big words. Well, you know, maybe that's just part of it. Yeah, of I don't it know. The, the, the big words of um, philosophy, it seems like you don't know until you take it, whenever you take it. But, sure, so. sure. Like, reading Faulkner at 15, what is that going to do for anybody? But reading Faulkner in your 30s is pretty awesome. Yeah. As true. I personally believe. I love Faulkner. Um, have I, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that I think I've read possibly no folder. Uh, um, See, that's something I wouldn't admit to. Would. <laughs> that, would, that would be private. That would be you. private, yeah. yeah. No, uh, yeah, read all of the F. F. Scott Fitzgerald novels. Uh, not the one that was like partial, that was published posthumously, but all the complete ones. Um, 
So you don't get the great Gatsby. You might like it, but you don't get it when you're in high school. Sure. And that's not because of big words. It's not. Uh, and that was uh, mostly a joke. <laughs> read like uh, half of Hemingway, but uh, Faulkner never got around to. I think there was like one thing that I thought was a Faulkner short story that I read uh, a long time ago, and then just came up once in conversation. You're um, we like, no, no, man, that's not Faulkner. So, <laughs> uh, so I've read zero Faulkner to my great shame. But uh, maybe you know we're about to move back to uh, to Georgia. Uh, there's a uh, there's another question about that, by the way. Um, whether yes, we Jen's are, new gig is moving to Georgia, teaching remotely. Yes, we are moving back to Georgia um, in just a couple weeks. I'm packing right now. So, um, yeah, I am. I am back in person. No more online teaching. Yeah, I will be doing some more uh, some more online teaching, uh, but uh, I think uh, I think Jen is is happy to be rid of it. Most definitely. Uh, I just had it with the online teaching. Yeah, I, I guess going back to the philosophy in like high school, like I think, so for sure, I think you should have to take some kind of like, not like symbolic logic, but like critical thinking, informal logic class like that. I, I think in an only slightly better educational system would be a high school graduation requirement. Um, beyond that, I don't know. I mean, I think there are some philosophy things that, high school students would find really interesting. I know there are some like private high schools where philosophy is taught. And, and I think in France, they teach philosophy at high school. Yeah. Some ancient philosophy. I think people, people come across in private schools. Um, I think ethics stuff is interesting. I mean, I, I think you can, you could, I wouldn't throw Hegel at a high school student, Sure, but I, yeah, yeah, I think I think there's some some e like Hume, how we were talking about. He's yeah, you can, you, can, you can have the high school kids write some Hume. Yeah. Um, I will. Uh, um, I don't know if it's going to make it better or worse that I haven't read a Faulkner, but I'm not going to admit uh, the uh, the age I was when I first started uh, reading. Uh, tried to read Hegel, it was precocious. Uh, I don't know how much I got out of it. But, uh, I have never tried to read Hegel. All right. Well, see, I wouldn't admit to that. Why? Because <laughs> he's one of the most important philosophers. I don't philosophy care. One of years, and, we had a little short reading of his that I was supposed to do for some philosophy class. I'm like, uh, why? And then the professor explained it, and I was like, okay, why? Why? But no, I I avoid the hard stuff. I'll be totally honest. Anything in grad school that looked hard, and there were other classes that looked easy. Why make it harder on yourself than you have to? Yeah, so just went for the extremely easy route of getting a PhD in analytic philosophy. So. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so Darius uh, continues the thought. He says, I was under the impression philosophy teaches you how to think instead of what to think, uh, which is something I didn't get enough of in school. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I, I do. I've, I've said that on syllabi, which I think is the correct term, but it always sounds pretentious, uh, whatever the multiple syllabus is, uh, said that on syllabi in the past, uh, that um, like especially, I, and I think I've especially been more likely to put this on syllabi after I've had more of a public profile, that, you know, because like on certain kinds of issues, lots of things we cover in philosophy class, no, but like on certain kinds of issues, you can just do a Google search and find out what I think, you know, so said, look, trust me, um, I'm not going to be happy. Like I'm going to be way happier reading a paper uh, that's like a good, well-argued paper arguing for stuff that I I completely disagree with. I'm going to be way happier than I I'm with that than with like a a boring paper, you know, arguing for things that I I, I agree with. Right? I mean, I don't I don't need that out of this. Right? I I want to. The point of a philosophy class is to give you the tools to figure this stuff out for yourself. Well, there are two components. Like if you're reading a historical figure. Uh, you need to know what the historical figure says, you know, so here's Kant. What does Kant say about this? And then there's the, what do you think about this? Let's evaluate this component. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, so yeah. And, and I mean, whatever, even, even like, even in contemporary stuff, right? I mean, obviously part of the skill that people are getting out of uh, taking a philosophy class where they're reading papers, you know, they're all from the last you know 70 years, whatever, like, Part of the skill is just reading argumentative essays and figuring out how you're supposed to read argumentative essays and, you know, which is a completely different skill from reading a textbook. 
Um, so, so yeah, I, I think it's always both, but I, I think the point is to, is to learn to think more carefully and rigorously about, you know, about it, um, you know, regardless of what conclusion you come, come to, because it's not, um, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe it's a little bit cheesy, but I mean, sometimes like on the first day of a class, you know, in person, uh, man, back when we got to you do that, uh, that I'd like put on the board, like this little thing with, uh, like literature is over here on one side and, you know, the sciences are over here on the other and philosophy is somewhere in between, uh, with the, the, the claim just being like, okay, um, there's a sense in which reading a novel can change your mind about something like, Oh, you know, I never thought about it that way before, you know, now I really see what people mean, you know, there's, so there's a sense which novel can change your mind about something, but it's not quite the same way that you say like, okay, here's uh, here's a laboratory experiment to see if such and such is true. Uh, and yeah, 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 you could ask a bunch of philosophy of science questions about exactly what the relationship is between evidence and theory, but like for the purpose of the, po the point we're making here, don't need to be that much of a nerd about it. You know, <laughs> like that they, you know what I mean when you say <laughs> that you can establish that things are true with experiments and studies and all that stuff that you do in the sciences. Uh, and philosophy is somewhere in between, meaning that it's, uh, it's not just like, oh, now I can see it from a different point of view. You do, you make arguments and there are better arguments and worse arguments and, um, and, and good objections and bad, all that stuff is true. But like, also there is clearly an end of the day sense in which, um, this is all stuff that is messy enough and hard enough to test that like there's tons of room for reasonable people to disagree about most of this. All right, let's see. Uh, all right, I think Strom uh, McCollum, uh, I, I guess that's for me, I should read it. Like, is, it uh, is for I, you. Uh, it's all caps, it light, light in August. Uh, <laughs> it's the, uh, yeah, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have admitted that earlier. <laughs> but there, there you have it. I, that is a true thing. I'll, I'll keep it real here. Uh, you know, read a bunch of other stuff by writing, you know, by, by big famous writers for that era, but never read any Faulkner. Uh, uh, Jay Andrew asked about stoicism. All right, all right, let's find that. Okay, Jay Andrew says, uh, I have a question. I always forget the definition of uh, stoicism. I zone out until Batman comes up. I'm not sure how Batman comes up with stoicism, uh, but then I am lost. Thoughts about? No. Okay. Uh, I like Batman. Sure. Who doesn't like Batman? <laughs> uh, stoicism. Yeah, I don't know about like any a definition of of stoicism. I mean, I can kind of describe stoicism, but um, so this is a influential school of um, philosophy in you know parts of the Greek world and in you know in the uh, in the Roman era. Um, and in the Roman world, you know, uh, Marcus Aurelius was a Roman emperor who was also a Stoic philosopher, uh, fam you know, wrote uh, a book called The Meditation, you know, The Meditations, uh, not to be confused with the Descartes Meditations. Lots of meditating going on. Yeah, meditating all over the place. Uh, I think Husserl has a book called Cartesian Meditations, you know, which just makes them all much more confusing. But, uh, but it, it's... Like the thing that, and like, uh, there's another school of philosophy from the same historical period called Epicureanism, um, which, uh, which is, uh, like, these are like rival schools, but they, they seem to be like, they're focused on a lot of the same questions, which is mostly not the kind of questions that I think when we do, uh, normative philosophy like kind of philosophy where you're worried about values uh then in contemporary world usually the kinds of questions that you're interested in is like is such and such action like a right a, you know the right thing to do or maybe you know if it's a slightly different kind is such and such form of society a good and just you know way for things to be organized but these guys i think are really much more interested in what's a good life uh, and the, um, and the answer to, uh, uh, you know, the answer to, uh, 
that I, I think that uh, that the Stoic philosophers give, if I understand it correctly, I'm not. I would not claim to know a lot about this at all. Uh, but uh, but I mean, I, I think it has to do with like like a lot of sort of um, I don't know emotional control and not uh, you know letting yourself be ruled over by your reason. And you know they they're they're big on reason. They're also big on nature and reason and nature and God are all sort of associated for them. And um, and there's stuff that sounds almost Buddhistish, you know that 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 uh, that, that some of these guys will will say. Uh, and, um, yeah, I don't know, actually. So, so there's a, uh, there's a past, uh, guest, uh, on, uh, on the show. Uh, so, um, she was on, uh, season two, episode nine. Uh, we were talking about a philosophical case for abortion rights, uh, Jamie Lombardi, uh, who actually has a essay about, uh, how she read, um, uh, the meditations of Marcus Aurelius um, when she was like going through a really, really rough period in her life after her husband died and how it helped her and all of that stuff. And and since reading that essay, I thought, oh, that sounds really interesting. But, you know, I mean, my, I haven't even read Faulkner yet. So I certainly, I certainly haven't read Marcus Aurelius. Mostly I just think about... No, yep, me neither. <laughs> mostly I just think about the Silence of the Lambs, you know, when Hannibal Lecter quotes Marcus Aurelius, you know, to Clarice Starlin. Uh, so so there you go. Um, and it is Burgi. That's how I like to say it anyway. Question, of course, was the plural of Burgess. Uh the doctor's bird's eye. Yeah, Silver says, I expected her no. to make the joke. I never tried to read Hegel <laughs> and I succeeded. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. Well, I think math, so uh, Silver says, uh, math teaches you how to think. Yeah, I think math and philosophy both in different ways, you know, teach you how to think. And, and these are closely related uh, subjects. I mean, going to ancient philosophy that I know a little bit more about, you know, uh, the, uh, like, um, you know, Plato, uh, was, was really big on, on the value of studying math because it, uh, it sort of took your mind away from the, the shifting and ultimately unreal world of material things to the, uh, to the eternal, you know, realm of form, you know, of, of the forms of things. Um, very, very down on study on like liter literature and art because those 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 take you in the opposite direction, you know, to uh, things that are attempts to represent the uh, that like transient material world. So that's like a shadow of a shadow. That's really bad. Uh, so uh, um, so you know, poets weren't going to be allowed in the city he was describing the Republic, except for ones who wrote. Uh, uh, panegyrics to the good and hymns to the gods, uh, but uh, but mathematicians, all you know, he was all for. All right, let's see. So Kathy, he would have loved Kathy. Yes. Um, uh, Kathy is is my mother, who is a uh, retired community college math professor. So. And department chair. Mm -hmm. Um, and has had other jobs, but I mean, like that's the one that's most relevant. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, gotta let's see. You want to do that? Not really. Okay. Well, we'll save it then. Well, I'll I'll talk about it at least, and you can chip it if you want later. But we'll save it for later. Uh, <laughs> <with that>. No. <laughs> okay. Um. So let's see. I just want to throw out Joe. I think if you if you uh, wanted to throw in some like modus ponens, modus tollens type stuff, I feel like that would be that would be good. And um, yeah, for the people for the washing dishes in yeah. the other room contingent, Joe says about to start my first year as a high school math teacher. I feel like it would be good to have some sort of logic and stats class that seems like the most useful math related stuff. Teach them about exponential growth. Yeah, it'd be good if we have another pandemic to have everybody get. And it would that. also be good just for life to <laughs> to know about things like that, um, the law of small numbers, you know, stuff like that. Sure. Uh, that's what I would do were I to teach high school math. Fair enough. Uh, so let's see. Uh, ooh, 
Silver has common misunderstanding about Latin. I is not the general plural of everything, just second declension nouns <laughs> ending in us. I am going to pretend that I understand that. No, uh, yes, yes, oh, that's yeah, yeah. true. Not, yeah. not the first declension, though. Mm, the, yeah, second, the, the second, second yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kathy says she was wondering if she would get a cameo. Well, of course. Uh, <laughs> Uh, question, if you, <laughs> Marcus Aurelius, does he talk about the Iberian gladiator he favors over his son? Uh, fun fact, that's actually the first movie I ever owned on DVD, uh, you know, in uh, 2001. Uh, so, I don't, I, don't, I think, uh, I, 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 although I, will, I was about to say, not very accurate about Roman history, but a fun movie. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, although, I will say that um, many years after I watched it, right? Like I originally watched the theater, you know, when it came out, and I don't know, was that two thousand or something? I, I remember it was two thousand one for sure. Um, uh, it was a birthday present, you know, when I got the uh, the DVD. But uh, uh, but I remember walking out of the theater with my friends, being like, mm -hmm. that that last part. I'm not going to spoil it if you haven't seen Gladiator, but that last part can't possibly have been historically accurate. But this no is, spoilers. This is two thousand spoiler free zone. This is two thousand and one. This is the pre Wikipedia era. So like I just wondered and then like I forgot about it because that's how it worked back in two thousand and one. Uh, and then um, many years later, I was uh, rewatching the HBO series Rome, and I went on Wikipedia to like check a couple of the like you know whether some things in the show that I was curious about were historically accurate, and that reminded me of wondering about the stuff about Gladiator. And uh, and I, I and the Emperor Commodus, you know, is the villain in the movie. Um, the specific thing I was wondering about the end that did not happen for sure. But um, the real stuff about Commodus is way crazier than anything in the movie. Like is like just way more over the top, like crazy. Like uh, he uh, he had. Uh, he he renamed all the months of the calendar after himself. I guess he had like you know a bunch of names, so that works. Uh, he renamed the city of Rome Colonia Commodia or something like that. Uh, he had statues of himself built all over the place as Hercules because he saw he was the reincarnation of Hercules. Uh, he he would uh, regularly personally fight in the arena, which was in terms of like Roman aristocratic sensibilities. Um, J. Andrew, did would, you find that on Wikipedia? Would be not unlike the, uh, uh, would be not unlike, um, you know, like the, the president of the United States, spending, you know, hanging out in a crack house, you know, like that would be about the equivalent, you know, in terms of social sensibilities. And uh, would, uh, and he'd have people like, um, like cripples tied together and dressed up as like a giant monster that he could fight in the arena and et cetera. Um, and, um, and was, uh, uh, killed because his political enemies uh, uh, paid off his uh, his uh, wrestling partner. Uh, you can decide for yourself whether that's a euphemism, you know, to assassinate him. So there you go. That's uh, that's that's communist. So none of that made it into Gladiator, and all much crazier than Gladiator. Okay, I I, I want to ask Silver a, uh, a but, but 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 uh, Andy says Wikipedia was launched uh, in January fifteenth, two thousand one. So fair enough, I stand correct. Yeah. So I was asking him, did he find that out on Wikipedia? I, I was not familiar with that, but yes. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, silver. Uh, silver. I would like to know if octopi is the appropriate plural of octopus because I was watching some videos about octopi octopuses, and um, you know, it's it's kind of unclear what is the the appropriate the correct plural so if you could let us know <laughs> or let me know ben doesn't care uh, but let me know all right uh 255 ad asked we ra rather live in the culture of the federation so. i have no idea what that means okay federation of star trek what's uh, the culture uh, it's from a series of science fiction novels by ian banks uh no i've never read and uh, I don't know. Both of them sound okay to me. Uh, like I guess it all. Some of it depends too on whether you think in Star Trek that the. Uh, I know the Federation is Star Trek, by the way. I just want to <laughs> clarify that. I just never heard of the culture before. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Both sound pretty. No, both sound pretty good. They they, they both 
<laughs> they both they both seem like incredibly advanced societies that don't really have material scarcity anymore and i guess and don't really seem to have an internal wars at least i think that the um uh that uh the culture i think that you know the federation it seems like a very egalitarian society although the the uh the the fleet uh is very like hierarchical and old school military but always figured that was just something they made up like to to for people who like otherwise were restless it's like okay you can go play with that but all right um huh, are we done with <laughs> Well, I got a zoned out there. He asked an important <laughs> question. I thought I, I thought uh, I should sure. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm nostalgic for it, but you know, I, I, it's not. I've like, never seen it. It's not like I don't get your point. Uh, Dara says, you know, it was a bad year when Gladiator won Best Picture. Uh, let's see. Do do. Oh, that's an interesting question. Silver Harlow asked, why is symbolic logic in the philosophy department instead of the math department? In some places, they're cross-listed. Yeah, I've seen that, too. And there, I think there are actually a lot of universities where, even though it's taught in the philosophy department... You can meet your math requirement with it. Uh-huh. Which is a very common thing that students will sign up for symbolic logic. Because they're, they're afraid of math. And then and then they'll, they kind of freak out because it looks too much like math to them. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it is... Like math, I mean, it's it's a, I mean, it's you're you're doing, um, I mean, the sort of origin, you know, even though technically sure, like the reason that logic would be interesting, like philosophically, is because it represents, you know, like symbolic logic is that it represents the structure of arguments, and you can think about when arguments are good or bad arguments or whatever. But like, when you're doing a fifty line proof, uh, that has nothing to do with any argument in English that anybody would ever make. Uh, like the, the only reason why that's interesting. I say that as somebody who actually really enjoys uh, doing 50 line proofs. Uh, like I, when I taught uh, the upper level symbolic logic class at Rutgers, I mean, I, I loved that, you know, like would take people through those like every day and, and, um, and like, it, and there's something really fun about getting to the point where you can kind of, see like 20 lines in advance you know where where it's going but like that pleasure is like i think that's the pleasure of just doing more advanced math i i, I don't know that that's that different you know that they um i i don't uh like it it seems like it's at that point it's interesting just as a mathematical structure so uh when i used to teach logic when we were at rutgers um I, I told them on the first day, if you're in here because you're afraid of math, you're just going to have to get over that because this is basically math. There just aren't any numbers, but it's math. Yeah. So suck it up. Yeah. And there are Let's do it. Yeah. And it'll all be fine. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you could have geometry or whatever, you know, without numbers, but uh, not that there's no numbers anywhere in there, but like the, you know, there's lots of, uh there's lots of it that you can do without it but yeah um yeah right that that seems right so i, I guess partially it's because philosophers are interested in arguments and even though like we just said symbolic logic like there's a little bit of it that's relevant to real arguments and then there's a bunch of it that really isn't you know but uh um but it's, that's, that's what I was saying to Joe about uh, his math, high school math class. You know, you could do some modus ponens level stuff. Yeah, for, for people who, who might be watching this who haven't taken a class where they mentioned that modus ponens is just uh, if A, then B, premise to A, conclusion B, uh, and, but like basic argument forms like that, right? Like not all of them are as obvious as that, but like basic argument forms like that. Yeah. I think that, that, that would be useful and good, even a high school math class. I mean, I remember my high school geometry class, the, uh, the first chapter was, was super logic-y and I really liked it because it was like setting people up for like how proofs work. And, and I was all into that. I got like a 97 on the first test and then the, then the rest of the class <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just kind of zoned out. <laughs> I didn't take geometry. So, so. Uh, all of the grades slipped way off from that because that was the part that actually that I, I actually found interesting. Uh, maybe that's 
you know, as bad in a different way as admitting the fault kind of thing. But um, although I will say I, I did uh, when I was on, well, actually after I was on uh, the Thaddeus Russell's uh, unregistered podcast, I was listening to a different episode of it where he interviewed uh, Cedric Johnson, who has not been on JTA. He should, but um, it's, but it's, it's certainly somebody who lots of people who watch the show might know. So I was listening to that interview. It was a really interesting interview because they got into his family background and stuff like that in a way I haven't heard him talk about other places. Um, and he, uh, and they were starting to talk about high school and, and Thad asked him, oh, um, so, so you were all, you know, straight A student or whatever. It's like, oh no, you know, <laughs> like I, I was a, I was a total slacker in high school, you know, and, and uh, Thad has said that that was something that it's like, he said nearly all the guests on that show or all of what's talked about had in common that they were all like really bad students in high school. And then in college, they actually got interested in their good students, which was a hundred percent my experience. It wasn't mine. I was a good high school student. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I got, I became worse and worse of a student as I went along. Yeah. It was good in high school. Um, I was good. I was good at undergrad. I was still good in my master's program. I got to my PhD program and I was just like, what is? Well, you still got the PhD. So I did. How, how bad it could have been. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Um, oh, so uh, 255 AD has an objection to your position on adoption. Said uh, you should. Then it would be fine to have your own kids. So the question is, you should always choose adoption over having your own kids. But if everyone followed that rule, wouldn't there be no kids to adopt? So I guess the I guess the rule would actually be what if if there are kids if who there need are to, kids who who need adoption, then you should adopt them. And if there are no kids who need adopting, and you want to have your own kids, go for it. Although there are other arguments against having your own kids, but um, no, I'm just saying there are okay. there are other arguments, but. Uh, I understand people want to be parents, weirdos want to be parents. And, um, you know, who am I, who am I to say somebody shouldn't be a parent if they want to be a parent? Well, some people shouldn't be parents, but, uh, yeah. All right. Jen's position, not mine. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well, they did ask me. Sure. Just, just, because just, I, I said I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just disavowing and disassociating myself <laughs> from <laughs> All of this borderline antinatalist weirdness. So, uh, ooh, uh, thank you for the super chat. Uh, Taddeus, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, says randomer for majority report. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe not appropriate. Ben, you mentioned Marxist beta philosophy and socialist practice. Did I misunderstand, Tad? Okay. Uh, I'm glad this is directed at you because I have nothing to offer here. Yeah, so I, I guess I'd say something slightly different. I think this is broadly philosophy Friday. So I, I just, I just say, I think socialism is a description of a form of social organization, an economic system. Uh, it's not, it's not like a theory. It's a, it's a possible outcome of you know historical political process. Whereas Marxism is a theory. So sometimes people will say things like they'll use phrases like Marxist society or something. And my possibly too nitpicky objection was that doesn't really make sense. It's like a category mistake because uh, I can't imagine you being nitpicky. Yeah. Well, this was the first time. Uh, <laughs> since, first and last. Uh, since, you know, Marxism is, is a theory of history and a political philosophy, but it's not like, the name of like a kind of society or a kind of economy. So that's the distinction that I was making, right? You know, Marxism has a certain theory about how it is that capitalism comes out of feudalism and how it is that, you know, uh, inshallah, you know, uh, socialism could, uh, could come out of capitalism, but, uh, but it's, but that's a, but that's, but, but that's a different thing from like, it's like libertarianism and capitalism are two different things. Uh, you know, libertarianism might be a political philosophy that would lead you to support capitalism, but it's not the name of an economic system. Uh, similarly, I'd say about Marxism and socialism. I hope that's clear. I could have been learning something here, but I was learning something else about octopuses. But then it says long you. I 
Okay, Silver says the correct plural in English is octopuses. Loan word take that inflection of their new language. In Greek, it would be octopodes. That's fun. Uh, the word didn't exist in Latin uh, where the plural might be I or us. With a... Okay. With a long U. Oh, with a long U. Okay. Mm -hmm. So can you write it out like how a normal person... Octopus! What should pronounce it? All right. Uh, like not with these long U and, and stuff like that, but like us. Explain it like we're in fifth grade. All right. Uh, Dara says if anyone does choose to adopt, never hide it from. That's an interesting question, actually. Like, I guess there's, I guess not hiding it doesn't mean you have to like volunteer it super early, like just so you know. Well, things are <laughs> age appropriate. Uh, you know, but I don't I don't think it should ever be a shock. I think you should start preparing them when they're little, telling them age appropriate things so that once you get into the full, um, you know, giving them the full picture that it kind of builds on what you had told them when they were younger. Yeah. And always tell them. Um, because if, if you don't, they're going to find out <laughs> and then. The, the relationship is is going to be sure strained, pretty... strained by that sure well i would i would say more than strained well I, I, i'm sure there are people who get past it but yeah well yeah but but, but, but it's going to be a problem in the moment yeah so. it is it is definitely sure. going to be a problem and i don't say this from personal experience i mean as far as i know i was <laughs> oh freddie has, 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 <laughs> hasn't told you yet that you're adopted <laughs> uh what <laughs> no but apparently uh, I, maybe I, she shouldn't have told me that. i uh <laughs> I'm actually just like my dad, so I, much to my chagrin, sometimes my mom calls me Little Thomas when I do something that's. Um, yeah, my mom just texted me that to <laughs> tell me that I'm adopted. So I guess well, you had to tell me during Philosophy Friday. You couldn't even wait until I was off of YouTube. Um, so uh, Munkaruj uh, twenty one oh eight uh, said, "Are uh, you a mask guy in general, Ben?" Well, yeah. I mean, I I didn't. I mean, my experience in high school and college, you know, undergrad was like, I would, I would do terribly in one math class, but then at the next opportunity, I would test into the next one somehow. Uh, so, I understand that. Uh, like, I don't know. I must have picked some of it up along the way, you know. But, uh, uh, but, but I, I, I tended to. Um, uh, this is, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I. I I think that I think that the ways that math is taught by many high school teachers, not all, um, but many, uh, I think doesn't necessarily lend itself to people getting passionate about the subject. Uh, there are this is something that Kathy has said. It's not math that's boring or hard. It's the way that it's taught, which is badly a lot of the time. Yeah, and also I I, I also just. Admitted earlier, I was a terrible student in high school in general, you know, so I wasn't, you know, but like uh, English class or something, it's like, okay, I might end up getting interested and, in, you know, uh, math classes oftentimes the way they're presented, I didn't. That said, I will say doing graduate work in philosophy, like there are certain aspects of math that I actually got interested in through through doing that, you know, that uh, that I that set theory, stuff like that. Um, so I, I, th I think I became more of a math guy over the course of, um, you know, over like over the course of, of being in grad school, like for my qualifying exams that you take after you finish your coursework, you know, and then like before you're ready to do a dissertation proposal, like one of the areas that I took the quals in was philosophy of math. Um, so. Okay, well, not that, that you asked me, but my, my opportunities to become a math person were very limited. I went to a small high school and there was no trig. There was no calc. You know, we had uh, we had algebra one and we had algebra two and that was as far as it went. And uh, I got to college and I took college algebra and that was all I needed. So yeah. there you go. Which is, by the way, um, there's a uh, professor, there's a con scholar who taught at uh, Miami when uh, we were there. Um well, uh, after I was done taking coursework, but I mean, I, you know, I was friends with him and uh, he's now uh, teaching in Canada. I never took uh, a class from him because his classes looked hard. 
<laughs> and um, but anyway, very 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 smart guy. Like he uh, uh, he would like he would do this thing like in Q and A sometimes in talks where like he'd be going back and forth with somebody about some objection. He'd be like, okay, look, I know what you're about to say, right? It's blah blah blah. And they'd be like, yeah. It's like okay, here's the problem with that. So, uh, <laughs> and, but. Um, I remember him telling me once that as an undergrad, he was a double major in math and philosophy and, and he was like torn between which one to go to grad school in. And I always thought his reason for picking philosophy was really interesting, which is they said, look, realistically, most people, unless you're just a superstar, uh, you know, who come out of like any academic field, you know, you're going to spend most of your time teaching like introductory level classes in that field. That's, that's what, you know, you're going to be doing like semester after semester after semester. And so the, uh, the gap between um, what you're actually interested in as a mathematician, like in your research and, uh, and, and those introductory level classes is like this, the gap between what you're actually interested in as a philosopher and what you teach in introductory level philosophy classes is like this, because. Uh, I love teaching introductory level philosophy. Yeah. Get them while they're young. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I, me too. Uh, but, uh, you know, I said, look, there, there are no interesting unsolved problems in college algebra. Uh, whereas uh, <laughs> intro, intro to No, they were all over my homework. Unsolved problems <laughs> in college algebra. Whereas intro to philosophy is nothing but unsolved, interesting unsolved problems. That, uh, that there are, even though there are certain moves that you'd make or things that you bring into it or whatever that are, you're obviously not talking about an intro. Like a lot of the basic issues that you're exploring in intro are the things that, um, that have that, uh, that you're like might be interested in and trying to figure out, you know, throughout your, your career. Um, and, and like, certainly, and like, certainly you, you see students in like intro intro classes having like little epiphanies all the time. Cause this is, there are like certain basic things they always believed. And this is the first time they were ever exposed to like other perspectives on it or questioning. And, you know, and it's, it's fun to watch. Let's see. Um, and to indoctrinate them into a leftist viewpoint, which is really what we're there for. No, I mean, obviously place. that's like 90% of it, you know, is it's, it's to, it's to, no, I mean, <laughs> We're there to turn them all into little socialists. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. I mean, I, I honestly, I think um, I actually ran into uh, when I was still a you know, grad student, you know, but I was teaching for that. Like I, uh, uh, I ran into a former student at a, a May Day protest once and he was like, wow, I didn't even know you were a leftist, uh, which you know, is, is always, you know, I mean, not that like intro to philosophy, like there's very little that you talk about that has anything to do with politics anyway, but, um, but, or, you know, you could do a political philosophy section. Yeah, you could, in intro you could do philosophy. a political philosophy section. I mean, I didn't at that time, but, you know, but you could, uh, but no, I don't either. But, uh, but yeah, no, you, you could do you that. Could. Um, but like, even, even if you did, I mean, whatever, like, like I said earlier, like the whole, the whole point is to, um, try to have interesting discussions to introduce people to lots of different perspectives and, and get them thinking and try to try to get them um, try to like, even, in, even in like an ethics class, maybe where I'm doing some political philosophy, like I want to give, like if I'm teaching like Robert Nozick's, you know, arguments for libertarianism uh, or, you know, Don Marquis argument that abortion is immoral or whatever. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm trying to, don't get me wrong. I'm sure that, you know, my bias is whatever, like, you know, like, like, like I'm not claiming to be able to totally transcend it, but I'm trying while in that context in the classroom to give the best possible case that I can, mm -hmm. you know, for these and to like really show it's like, okay, here's exactly where Marquis is coming from. You know, this is why he thinks that. And, oh, and you give you know, from each side, you know, yeah. this is a reading from someone who's pro-choice and here's a reading from the other side and let's evaluate these readings. And I always make a point of telling them you can agree with a conclusion without thinking that the argument itself is good. Um, or you can say, you know, this is a good argument, but you know, the, it goes wrong somewhere. Um, so, so there's, there's a difference between evaluating the argument and what you may 
think of the conclusion and and you know like i was saying you give one from each side so that you're not pushing one one viewpoint on them so was it octo op, octopuses octopuses all right I'm, I'm is that what you're saying heroically resisting the temptation to throw in the name of the james bond movie oh, jay andrew already said that oh yeah <laughs> but, um octopuses yeah um yeah, if you're if you're washing dishes, this is really octopuses. Octopuses. Yeah, for the for the dishwashers. Uh, gen, gen. Silver is trying to explain to me about Latin and declensions and octopus. What the correct <laughs> plural of octopus in different languages might be. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I think. Um, <laughs> Silver says uh, Latin should be. Uh, taught uh at least in video if not in person youtube text chat is not doing it uh, i'm doing but, uh, my best I'm they, they actually let it on duolingo now don't they uh, yeah they do. I, I think they do they do yeah um I do that in my spare time try and pick up a little latin all right uh let's see so somebody recommends why have children by christine overall uh, counter arguments to antinatalism. Uh, Tadia says, took me three attempts to read chapter one, get a basic grip of give an argument. Wonder if he means chapter one or he means one of the later chapters. I know a lot of the, a lot of people uh, didn't like the, um, like a, even, so the, the chapter that was the most polarizing and give them an argument was the, uh, the, the Trotsky and Ayn Rand one. Yeah. Uh, oh man. There's some skimming going on there. What we was said, that private? What we said earlier about how Jen is going to continue to be on the show. Nope. Uh, so, uh, but yeah. I mean, the rest of it, really good, especially the dedication. <laughs> um, but that chapter uh, was a little iffy. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, because it was the most like abstract kind of theoretical chapter in the book. And uh uh, also had truth tables, which some people didn't like. Uh, so, but no, I'm fine with truth tables. I just don't need to know yeah. that much about. Yeah, Jed is actually a very, very, very good symbolic logic teacher. I really am. Uh, I really am. But, uh, but yeah, like, like because it was the most abstract theoretical argument in the book, some people loved it, and it was their favorite chapter. But like, also, if if anybody said, "Oh, I, I liked it all except the one chapter about that," I'd, I'd already know what, which one they were going to say. <laughs> uh let's see <laughs> um wicked energy says have you ever <coughs> countered any christian presuppositionalist uh arguments so uh presuppositionalism is the view um that uh that some theologians take that it's actually impossible to have an argument from neutral premises about whether God exists or whether Christianity is true or anything like this, because I think I'm representing this right. You know, the, what they'll say is that uh, what you think about everything else is going to be so thoroughly influenced by your answer to those questions that you just can't separate it to, to uh, you know, you, you can't like, you can't just, there's no neutral ground on which to conduct that argument. That's what they think. Uh, that sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does. So, uh, Douglas Wilson is a big advocate of that. I actually did do a debate with him about um, uh, whether atheism uh, was immoral. Uh, you can watch that uh, on, on YouTube. It was originally on the Modern Day Debate Channel. I'm going to say no. Um, appreciate that, Ben. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so, anyway, yeah, you can watch that. Uh, it was originally on the Modern Day Debate Channel, but we re aired it you know, here also, and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, distinguished professors of philosophy, uh, Mark Douglas Warren and, uh, and Ryan Lake, uh, my favorite person, uh, it hurts every time, uh, <laughs> did a, uh, um, you know, did a, did a debate breakdown of that, you know, which, which I obviously absented myself from, uh, so, uh, that was, uh, uh, yeah, which was, yeah, which which was fun. I mean, like I I done. That's not the kind of thing that I normally debate, and I'm actually 
and even when I did do it, like I, in my opening statement, I kind of did two minutes of throat clearing about how, like, I wouldn't want anybody who mostly knows me from political things to watch this and get the impression that I'm the kind of atheist who thinks that, uh, like, uh, it's really, really important to convince everybody in the world, you know, not to, uh, you know, not to be religious and that this is... We so wouldn't be married if that was <laughs> a, a yeah. foundational point of Ben. Yes. Well, actually, I did get... This Ryan Lake. Uh, this is... Uh, um, and which No, the... Oh. Jay Andrew. Oh, uh, Jay Andrew asked who would win in a fight, Gladiator or Ryan Lake. Yeah, Ryan Lake? I, I don't know. I mean... Um, I've okay. Brian Lake is my favorite person, and as such, yeah. Um, I mean, I've actually seen Ryan get in fights, and um, not like you know, anger, but you know, sparring, and uh, you know, and I'm I'm not saying he can't hold his own, but I I I think that I think the Gladiator, uh, like the Russell Pro Claire character in Gladiator, I assume that's what we're talking about here, or really, I think honestly, <laughs> any random Roman Gladiator would win that. Uh, but, uh, Ryan barfed all over my ex once. And see, that would be private. Why? <laughs> they weren't like in a room alone together. People know about it. So. Yeah, but not, Ryan barfed but over my ex. Once, not all was, of you two knew about it until yeah, just, but they do now. <laughs> until just now, but in any case, uh, which was amazing. But yeah, and I love that. But the point that the. The point that Jen just made about the uh, how we Ryan would, barfing. Uh, oh, we wouldn't be married, you know. Uh, I I did uh, I did actually manage to work that into the Douglas Wilson debate. So uh, I I said in that two minutes of throat clearing, uh, I I said uh, that uh, um, that you know actually you know I think that look uh, I think it's to my mind it's an almost completely separate subject. I mean, obviously you can be a fundamentalist and like that could lead you to 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 think you know horrible, dangerous things. But like, uh, but other than that, you know, it's, it's almost a completely separate subject. Um, uh, and so I, you know, look, uh, you know, you had, uh, you know, John Brown was inspired by Christianity to, to do good things. Robert E. Lee was inspired by Christianity to fight for the most evil cause in human history, which was a little jab at, at, at Wilson because he's written stuff uh, that's kind of like historical revisionism about the South. Uh, but but I have tons of respect for you know, Christian socialists like Cornel West or Terry Eagleton or to pick a third example of a progressive Christian completely at random. Uh, my wife, Jennifer Burgess, which was the one time I actually got a laugh out of, uh, out, out of uh, Pastor Wilson in that debate. <laughs> but uh, Octopus. 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 Okay. Octopus. Very good. Uh <laughs> Well, 70, you know, 74 people, right? So Trev B5 says all of you two. Well, 74, a little, okay. <laughs> 74 right now. That's right. <laughs> but everybody, but anybody in the world who is inclined to could watch This it is later. not to say anything negative about Ryan. This is to say something very, very positive about Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so in any case, uh, like, you know, Wilson's view is uh, is basically that if you're an atheist, there's no way to make sense of the idea that you have uh, moral obligations not to do something you could get away with doing. Uh, and he'd actually written a book of essays back and forth arguing about this with Christopher Hitchens, which I'd read his research for the book I'm writing about Hitchens. And that book annoyed me enough that that's why like I expressed an interest in, uh, in doing this debate. Uh, but uh, so there's a lot of, um, yeah, like uh, I, I think it, it just seems like a basic inability to separate moral reasons from prudential reasons. Like if your only reason for not doing something is that you think that you're going to be punished for doing it, uh, whether by you know man or God, right? You hell far. <laughs> right. Whether it, whether you, whether what you're worried about is going to jail or going to hell. If that's yeah, I don't. Uh, the the thing that keeps me from committing mass murder is not the fear of hell far. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that seems like that's not a moral motivation at all. Right. Would be. My thing. <laughs> but um, Ryan says, uh, I don't know if I could beat a Roman gladiator, but I think I'd have a good chance to fight with Russell Crowe. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, 
Oh, uh, yeah. Um, let's see, 255 AD. So this is a rephrase of his earlier question, which I which I said we'd get back to and I'd at least say something about. So he says, uh, would you want to get bored in heaven or just bleep out of existence when you die? Um, and, I think this is a false dichotomy. Yeah, I mean, there could be other options, but um, this... I mean, I mean, I don't know where the assumption that you would get bored in heaven comes. I mean, what is the rationale for that? Yeah, I think part of this depends on how you're thinking about heaven. Like, If heaven is a perfect place, it's impossible to get bored. Yeah. I, I would say. So, I mean, this is kind of, this is what they were talking, like, this is kind of what they were doing in the... the no spoilers. Uh, a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, uh, does this just stop. Just this was a, this was a plot point in a TV show. Okay. Uh, whether uh, you know whether there's anything, and and I think that like sometimes some people when they talk about heaven, it's like oh you're with God in some way that's like uh, there are some theists who think that God is outside of time, which I'm not always totally sure I know what that means and. Or to be a little bit more polemical about it, I'm not always totally sure they know what it means, but uh, but I think, uh, but if that's true, then maybe like it's just some state of reality that's so totally different that the boredom question just doesn't make sense. But if you're imagining like, and certainly there are religions that imagine this, or there are versions of different religions at least that imagine this, if you're imagining that you have like a state of existence that's like this, but better, you know, that like you're, you're, you know, sort of linearly experiencing time and, and uh, it's just that you're in some sort of, I don't know, astral body experiencing, you know, wonderful pleasure all the time. Or if you're sitting on a cloud playing a harp, yeah, that would get boring. Yeah. Unless you really love the harp. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but then of course the thought is, okay, but what wouldn't get boring if you did it for long enough? being with you Aww. <laughs> so. but that's the thing like if i could have eternity to be with ben how how could that get boring well i appreciate that uh <laughs> okay yeah. clearly you uh have opposing thoughts no <laughs> uh, but uh, but in any case uh this this is um the idea that if you were going to live like literally forever and ever and ever and ever and ever that um, that you would like at some point just want it to stop. Like I've thought about that. I don't know. I mean, this is the kind of thing that used to bug me more, but then it's like, well, I don't know. I mean, like, like whatever happens, I clearly don't get to decide. So there's really no reason to worry about it. Uh, I think if I did get to decide though, I think what I want is like 10,000 year renewable lease, you know, see if, uh, see how I felt at the end of it, whether I wanted another 10,000, uh, which, you know, anyway. If I was there. Yes. If Jen were there, I would of course always take the extra 10,000. <laughs> um, Harp on, J. Andrew. Harp on. Uh... Well, sure. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm certainly not. But, yeah, but uh, what about me? Yeah, you you probably will. Uh, Dancing Circle says, uh, "Who's saying both of y'all going to heaven?" But, yeah. Um, yeah, but the whole P and Q uh, that you know those are supposed to stand in for things. So if you if you can put an arg an actual argument into that form, so, which so, is so Silver says, but that class is all P's and Q's and or is not much use for arguments. Why well, I thought it was more like a math class. Okay, yeah. So right, like you know. Like those are stand-ins, whereas two and four, those are not stand-ins, those are what they are. So if you can teach somebody to reason according to these, you know, if you can have them have a reading and pick out what is the P, what is the Q, and then fit it into these argument forms. Okay, is this a valid argument or is this an invalid argument? There is some value in that. Yeah. Um, I was trying to remember the right the setup to the joke, uh, but uh, it's one of these things. Uh, there are all these jokes that are a um, physicist, a mathematician, and an engineer uh, are observing something and coming to different conclusions so like 
uh, they're in a train and they see a purple cow and the uh, engineer says, oh my God, uh, oh my God, there are purple cows you know, here. And uh, the physicist says, no, let's be careful. Right? There's the, we don't, what we know is there's at least one purple cow. And then the mathematician says, eh, let's be a little more careful. What we know is there's at least one half of one purple cow. Uh, and yeah, don't laugh at that. But the, uh, the, Why? <laughs> so, uh, but that's just an example to give the structure of these jokes. So uh, this one, I don't remember the whole setup too, but the um, it's about three people leaving uh you know, a house and such and such many people come in at this point and put such and such many people leave at that point. And the mathematician comes to the conclusion that there are negative two people in the house. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was thinking about the stand-ins and I was like, well, I'm the numbers. I mean, that's stand-ins if you're doing quantitative reasoning, you know, if they're, I have two apples and, you know, and then you add three apples, you know, how many apples are there? But I guess only mind-numbingly basic uh, math uh, uh, in that example. But I mean, whatever. I mean, like math obviously is is useful for quantitative reasoning and incredibly complicated scientific theories. And so, I get it. Um, Thanks. Yeah, Trev B5, who apparently believes that Jen didn't laugh because she didn't get the joke, says you only see one side of cow at a time. <laughs> but I didn't get it. Oh, you didn't and now it. I get because I, I, I said, why? Why do we? Okay, I, 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 I thought you just weren't laughing because it was unspeakably lame. But uh... okay, well, <laughs> well, I, I didn't get it, and now I realize why it's unspeakably lame. So thanks. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So. But but certainly in the logic case, you know, yeah, the P's and Q's stand for for statements. Uh, so, which I, I mean, maybe it's similar to the point about teaching math. I think there's, it's definitely easy to lose track of the fact that these are stand-ins for statements. Uh, but it but certainly again, like the lower levels of symbolic logic are useful for thinking about arguments because. You know, because you say, okay, is this a valid argument form? Is this an argument form where any premises that, you know, that have this structure, um, that it'll never be possible for those premises to all be true without the conclusion being true? Um, that's, that is actually a really useful thing for, for breaking down arguments. But yeah, certainly when you get up to like, uh, after a certain point in the semester, you know, in the symbolic logic class, you've gone beyond the stuff that's actually useful. Yeah, for thinking, you're just like, yeah, it's math. For thinking about real art. Just accept you know? it's <laughs> math. You know, when it's like, you know, premise one, you know, P and not Q in parentheses, or parentheses not the case so that, you know, R and not S, if that, you know, like, like, you know, that's like, yeah, no, clearly this is, uh, way more complicated than the structure of anything that anybody ever actually says in a real argument, or even how you would represent the argument. If you Unless were. you're writing a philosophy article. Those are the only sometimes exceptions. But uh, Then you will see arguments of that form. Yeah. All right. Uh, somebody said earlier, let me see if I can find this again. Um Strom says, would frail non engineerings that mean you're nine, in your 90s, mm -hmm. uh, rather be 20 again or die? They'd rather be 20 again, bored by eternal life ideas, silly, a little. Eh, maybe. I mean, I think, sure. I mean, 90, you know, 90 some years might not be enough, but, you know, like, or certainly not enough if you could have the physical vitality and all that stuff, but that doesn't. No yeah, nobody wants to live forever as a 90 year old. Right. Uh, <laughs> But um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that like ten thousand years wouldn't be enough if you weren't with Jen. So let's see. Nice. <laughs> that was smooth right there. Uh yeah. Let's see. Um. So somebody, I'm having trouble finding the chat now. Uh, but, uh, but somebody earlier, no, not about Voyager. Just let that go. <laughs> uh, yeah. J Just let it go. Andy keeps asking questions oh. about Voyager. Uh, the, actually the only, I've seen like a very little bit of, of TNG. Uh, the only, the only Star Trek I ever really liked was the original series, 
Mm. Ah, let's see. The card. Make it so. <laughs> so sexy. Make it so. Let's see. Uh, okay, well, anyway. I, oh, here we go. I found it. So Eric asks, uh, any recommendation on how someone could get educated on symbolic logic? Without graduate school, would love to be able to see what our argument is going three lines in. Uh, so I think, well, first of all, uh, certainly literally without graduate school, I mean. Look for something good on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, like introductory symbolic logic is usually taught to undergrads anyway, but uh, but like outside of college, I assume is the, is the real question, like, like without taking yeah. college class. And yeah, I think you can. I mean, I... I mean, I essentially did that uh, when when I started uh, grad school. I mean, before uh, Miami, which is where I, you know got my PhD, met Jen, you know. But before that, I got my master's at Western Michigan, uh, and I was uh, supposed to start in fall of two thousand and three, and that didn't happen. Um, largely because I was spending all of spring 2003 organizing anti-war protests. And um, it's the time the invasion of Iraq was starting. And uh, and that was taking up enough of my time. I managed to fail like a, a gen ed requirement that any sentient being should have, you know, should have been able to pass. Uh, so um, I'd already been accepted, but they were nice enough to hold my acceptance and also my uh, assistantship, you know, until the spring. Uh, but normally the way that program works is you spend a year as a TA, so teaching assistant in, in, uh, in class taught by one of the professors there, and then in the second year you teach your own class. Uh, but since I was started in spring, you know, it was a little unclear how that was going to work. And uh, so like a couple months after I'd started, uh, I was just sort of looking through the like course offerings for the fall, just out of curiosity. And I think I, I think, you know, I, I don't know, my eye sort of skimmed over the undergrad ones. I was like, oh, symbolic logic, field 225, symbolic logic, Burgess. Well, crap, because I'd never taken symbolic logic as an undergrad. So I ended up spending the summer teaching it to myself out of the textbook that I was going to use in the fall. So I'm not sure how good an educational experience the first couple rounds of students got, you know, but uh, but it was great for me, right? Because that's, that's another thing I was going to say, get a textbook. Yeah. So I think if you have a textbook, and especially if you have a textbook and a buddy to like go through it with you, yeah, that would be even better. Yeah, um, I've actually thought about teaching, like in a non-university setting, uh, like the art, like the classes that I taught for, well, like the class that I taught for Thaddeus Russell's thing, Renegade University, or the class that I taught for um, Michael Alberts, you know, the School of Social and Cultural Change, like something like that that would just like like just a, a straight like symbolic logic class you've thought about this i have and you didn't run it by me you didn't think i'd be interested i mean the thought crossed my mind and you didn't run it by me no babe i do not run by every thought that crosses my mind does not you know get me running into the other room <laughs> <laughs> well it's not like it would bother me that much i mean how often does that happen yeah that's true once a week maybe <laughs> But yeah, I would be totally down to to do that with you. Cool. Yeah, that'd be great. We should do that. Uh, okay, Eric, uh, you can take symbolic logic for me and Jen online. We'll uh, details t uh, tbd. <laughs> ben did say in the in the dedication. Well, you you can tell Ben. Uh, yeah. Let's see. give an argument. Ah. To my beautiful wife, Jennifer, among her many virtues, she's the best logic instructor I know. So there we go. Uh, Ralph Nader actually read that aloud when uh, <laughs> when I came on his show, uh, Ralph Nader Radio, Radio Hour. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, Darius, I think you're completely right. Um. Yeah, it's not a subject I've I've gotten into on air, and I don't think this is going to be the time that I do. So, we'll uh, we'll leave that hanging. What, Darius? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, I, or I don't know. I can plead the fifth, and you can say what you think if you want. I I said what I think. Okay. A question was about veganism, uh, and and Darius says he finds 
Oh, actually, hold on. I think I think the way he said it might have been the opposite, although he might have meant what you thought. Darius, did you mean that you think the arguments for veganism are hard to beat or the arguments against veganism are hard to beat? Because technically Well, he says I'm I'm I've conceded I'm a less moral being. I'm less moral being an omnivore. Yeah, I think that's true. No comment. Uh, Why? Yeah. Uh, so let's see. Um, you know, if you're cool with that, I mean, that, the, the, okay. So this is what I think about it. All right. I think you would need, at least need, to, if you're going to continue to eat meat, then you need to watch one of those slaughterhouse videos and make a, an informed decision about what you're doing. And and if you do that, if you make an informed decision, then your decision is your decision. Uh, a lot of people I know, oh, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to think about the state being a cow. I don't want to think about how it was. Well, don't you want to make informed decisions in your life, especially when they're when they're moral decisions? So that's what I would say. Get your information, make an informed decision, go from there. All right. Uh, so, um, I uh, know I'm not a vegan. Right. Um, Aaron, uh, okay. Aaron asked for basically philosophy reading recommendations, having to do with socialism. Uh, I actually do think that my first book is not a terrible place to start. I know of course that, you don't. I know that sounds <laughs> super arrogant, but like, you know, I mean, I think, I think it's accessible and it, it, it does go through a, a lot of arguments, but, um, but uh, to be less arrogant and stop recommending my own work, uh, I think uh, G.A. Cohen. I, I, I would I would just uh, basically read everything by G.A. Cohen. Um, he he's uh, I think one of the um, like I think just as far as like that kind of soft spot between being um, like a super rigorous philosopher and the way he makes arguments. And um, also just being a really good writer, which is like rare enough in analytic philosophy that like it's it's worth mentioning, you know, when it exists. Uh, like like there are there are some for sure, right? But you know, but it's, you know, it's a lot of a lot of people who aren't. Uh, so being a really good writer, uh, being a really rigorous philosopher, and uh, and and just having a good like. Um, I don't know exactly how to put this, but not just sort of like rigorous in a kind of clever way, but like kind of heft to it. Like, like, like he's, he's, heft. he's like Derek Parfit is another person who I, who I, I think of this way. And Parfit doesn't write about political things mostly, you know, but, but just like, like as far as other philosophers who write like this and who have these particular virtues, you know, that I think Co like Cohen, so Jerry Cohen, G.A. Cohen, the guy I mentioned, and Derek Parfit are both people who like, do a really good job of both like okay they will like chase down every possible objection to an argument all that stuff they're really good at that but like also they're really good at sort of doing this like very thoughtful insightful sort of like okay why do we care about this at all like let's let's think about it in in bigger terms and not just sort of try to make sure i've answered all the objections that you can make in an nitpicky way to this argument so that would be my suggestion um yeah, uh, <laughs> Joshua Pym, I guess, must be going to grad school and says this idea to each topic you never learned about. I really hope they don't do that to me. Uh, to be to be fair, I think in this, I'm not quite sure why it worked out this way, but I, I think it's, there are many places where they might, you know, ask you. Uh, <laughs> well, the other thing is logic is generally a requirement at the undergrad level uh, for a philosophy major and a requirement to get into grad school. So by the time you're there, they can reasonably expect that, you, that you've taken it. And um, you know, like, like in philosophy, once, once you're at a certain point, they just expect that you know how to teach any introductory class. Yeah, and that, which, which would be like pretty much uh, formal logic, informal logic, critical thinking, that sort of business intro to philosophy, intro to ethics. Those are, those are pretty much the, the introductory classes. Uh, and I should say also, I understand in my case, like I probably slipped in with that requirement because uh, I took a class in undergrad, like I went to a very small, small college. Uh, 
there were like two full-time philosopher professors there when I started. One of them retired uh, midway through when I was doing it. And to get through an entire philosophy major, you had to take tons of stuff by independent study, whatever. Uh, you know, it was actually, I mean, I really liked the college, but uh, but it is the course offerings were not, you know, extensive. And uh, they, uh, and so I took a class that was called Logic, but it was, really much more like a critical thinking class than a symbolic logic class. But I'm sure when they were looking over my coursework, when I apply, it's like, okay, logic, that's good. <laughs> so. I would also like to to mention Ryan's comment there that it has a cool cover. It does have a cool cover. It does have a cool cover, yes. That's uh, David Hume, Hushing Ben Shapiro. Uh, as they start to say facts, don't care about your feelings. Um, Many people think that the cover was done by Jay Andrew, but it was not. It was done by Ryan. Done by Ryan. Uh, Ryan uh, has uh, a uh, extensive career as a uh, as the artist and uh, author of a uh, philosophy themed web comic, uh, Chaos Pet. Uh, and Hang on, I saw something. You... Do, go ahead, talk. And uh, and so that's that's why I uh, asked if he'd be interested in drawing something for that. Uh, but it's it's good stuff. It's worth checking out. I think these days. It's migrated onto the uh, philosophy website, the Daily Noose, N-O-U-S. Uh, but the but the point is that one of the big themes of the book is this Hume-inspired takedown of the idea that there's some sort of tension between logic and like emotions, and explaining why that doesn't really make sense. Which is why sometimes I find it really frustrating. Every once in a while, I'll see somebody who you know has negative feelings about me. Uh, say, uh, say, oh, you know, Ben Burgess, he's always going around saying, like, you know, you should only care about logic and arguments and, you know, and, and not be emotional. Like, ah, read the damn book. That's not what I say. <laughs> but, uh, but in any case, what was the chat you wanted to? Um, well, again, since so, so, I was not asked, but I'm so, going to answer. So the question was, would you recommend reading cognitive science literature as a complement to learning about symbolic logic, for example, work on cognitive heuristics? by Daniel Kahneman. I was thinking actually when this went by that Jen would have stuff to say about this. Yeah, well, when we taught formal, how is it? Formal, formal reasoning. reasoning and decision-making. At Rutgers, everybody just calls it FURDM. For, well, we called it FURDM. I, th I think other people called it FURDM. Yeah, too. I thought that was our original thing. Okay, but anyway, uh, we had them read Thinking Fast and Slow. And um, I, I don't know that I would put it in a symbolic logic class, but I do use a lot of that stuff in my critical thinking class. We talk about cognitive biases and, and heuristics, stuff like that. And uh, I don't have them read like big in-depth things, but I do PowerPoints that go pretty in-depth with this stuff. And um, yeah, I think, I think it's important when you're doing critical thinking to not just teach them what to do, teach them what they are already doing and show them that, you know, in a lot of cases, these things are good, they're helpful, they they keep the brain from having to overwork itself because the brain does not like to work hard. Um, but when you're making important decisions and stuff, you need to be aware that the brain does fall into these uh, ruts, you know, and and to be aware that, that this is happening. Yeah. So, yeah, I do... Um, you know, and I'm always finding stuff on the internet and adding it in. I'm always adding more and more stuff in because I think this stuff is really cool just personally. And I think it goes, it goes really well in a critical thinking class. Fair enough. Um, yeah. Seconded. Uh, so uh, there was a, there's some questions from 255 AD uh, about my, dad's politics because i think i told the story once on the on the stream about the uh the um uh, his reaction to uh to, to reagan being reelected. you know when i was four years old is my first political memory uh but you know i, I told that just because i thought it was a funny story but honestly i think that um you know people who aren't uh, who, who don't seek out being public figures i think i think answering detailed questions about their views that eh, that feels a little I don't know about that, so uh, I think I think I'll uh, I think I'll respectfully skip that. Uh, but um, but yeah, I guess to add on to the the Kahneman thing, um, like so, I'm always really confused by this because sometimes I'll see people sort of use this as a sort of weird argument for uh, not. Um, 
for like it not being a really valuable thing to like think hard about how like the structure of arguments and what's a good argument and what's a bad argument and all that stuff. You'll say, oh, look at such and such cognitive science or psychology, you know, research that uh, that says that uh, that we don't actually like reason this way most of the time. It's like, yeah, no kidding. That's why it's a skill you have to learn, right? Like that's it's like yes, uh, that's that's like saying, you know, I can't see very well, so I clearly don't need glasses. All right. Um, and isn't that was his father? No, he's still he's still alive. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, so. that's 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 one of the reasons I'm trying to respect his privacy a little bit more than perhaps I've done in the past. But uh, yeah, he's he's still with yeah, us. So it's, it's, yes, very very much, very much, very so. much still with us. Um, let's see. I think it's easy to be a vegetarian even if you didn't grow up one. If you just decide, well. I'm gonna be a vegetarian. I mean, it's clearly, then, clearly like, not, because lots of people, lots of people do for a while, and then they they can't keep it up. Yeah, uh, I don't understand that. Okay, well, different people have different minds and different experiences. And <laughs> sure, sure, <laughs> sure. So the things that come easy to some don't. Come I guess to it, others. it depends on the reason why you you do it. But lots of people how become... important that reason is to you. Sure. Uh, but lots of people do become vegetarians for ethical reasons and then decide that they, you know, that like then go back or, you know, whether they're deciding or just sort of slipping. Um, that seems totally normal to me. Uh, ooh, Andy wants to know who'd win in a fight, Ryan Lake <laughs> or Gene Bajalon? Uh, Gene's English and comes from Hall where they have brawls at the pub on the regular. Uh, I like that. I like that. The, uh, he's, he's adopting, you know, Gene's speech patterns, you know, on the regular. What uh, makes you think Ryan doesn't have brawls at the pub on the regular? Yeah, for all you know, he does. Uh, I mean, other than the fact that he's a philosophy professor at his 40s, he probably doesn't do that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I could I could never become vegan because I I can do the soy milk for like maybe a month and then I'm kind of over it and vegan cheese no that's a that's a big no and um, vegan ice cream also a big no I just feel like it's such a dairy is such a big part of my life eggs you know what do you do when you go out. My brother-in-law is a vegan and it seems like he just eats beans all the time. And that's just not a life I can resign myself to. And yes, like the, like it was said, yes, I, I realize that I am not behaving as morally as I could be. So, so it seems um, but you like, have to recognize your own limitations. So it seems like you should understand extremely easily how some people could find vegetarianism too hard because no, it's way easier it's to by, be a by, by, like by, like the difference why, between why eating meat not, and going vegetarian is very small once you become a, the difference between eating everything and being a vegan is is huge i i don't know i think how small it is probably depends on how much meat was in your diet before and and how much you know? How much you like it, and you know. And I mean, I, I think. Oh, I loved it. I think there are a lot of people who don't find. It, who don't, I'm just talking about who like, don't regard it as a small difference. But I mean, like, like ease of finding food, and the the taste of the food, like replacing a lot of the, the you know, like, like I said, like the cheese and the milk, and replacing that is really hard. And when you go out to a restaurant, it's very easy in most cases to eat vegetarian. It would be much more difficult to eat vegan. Yeah. Although, again, I mean, like, there, like practically speaking, the there are there are certain restaurants where it's it's very hard. And I think, like, even like like you know, fifteen years ago, it was, it was probably much harder. But we're not living fifteen years ago. We're living now. Okay, I didn't realize that the answer was that specific to right now. But okay, okay, uh, and also. Depends where you live, etc. But uh, Taddeus, yes, that's the dude. Uh, G.A. Cohen. Um, let's see. Someone uh, wants to know if you're a DSA member. I saw that fly by. Oh. Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, Ryan says he did get in a fight at a bar once. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I don't know. Maybe Gene would beat him. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, the you know joke is Gene is also an academic at the same age. So I, I, I don't know how ferocious a bar fighter he is either, but uh, uh, although, you know, growing up there, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe he's done more of it than Ryan has. <laughs> uh, but uh, in any case, the answer, uh, I can't find that 
chat uh, there. Uh, no, you went zooming by it. Yeah, right, right there. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that was part of the thing about. Uh, oh. Anyway, uh, if it was a question about me, yes, I'm a, I am a, I am a DSA member. Uh, I uh, actually helped get uh, Central New Jersey DSA started um, back in uh, 20, 2016, um, sort of part of a core group of people who, who did that when during the period we were sort of going from being like the same four people always, you know, looking at each other, you know, from across the table at the, you know, bar or cafe or whatever, where the meeting was to the point where like right after the election, you know, when there would be like, you know, do it in the basement of the, uh, the, the faculty union hall at Rutgers and there'd be like 50 people there and people sitting on the window and stuff, uh, which is exciting. Uh, and, uh, fun fact, uh, for people who were on Twitter, like, uh, four years ago, uh, you might remember a very popular uh, left-wing account from back then called Larry Website, uh, and uh, the not his real name. Uh, you'll be shocked to know, uh, but uh, but yeah, Larry Website was also part of that core group of uh, of people uh, who uh, who got that DSA chapter going. Um, although as a dude named uh, Russell, who was the the main main person who did, uh, who was. Uh, who is now, uh, he's still a DSA activist, but he's in uh, Boston now. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, and, and I, 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 I am still, right? I mean, much less active. They get dues money for me every month. That's about it right now. But like, I, I will go, I have gone to like, I have uh, like spoken at DSA chapters and stuff when they've invited me or I think that's happened like DSA a couple times. Usually it's why DSA, um, like, college campuses and stuff uh, that do that. And I'm always really happy to do that. Um, I'm, and, you know, I mean, I'm not, uh, it's, I've got my criticisms of some things that some people in DSA do do sometimes, which I'm sure is shocking because usually I never have any criticisms of anything, but, uh, but I, I, I still think it's a tremendous net positive. Uh, and um, I, I was actually, I mean, I was really tickled by it earlier today. I got my, my article, uh, uh, my new article just came out in Jacobin today. Uh, the we need to imagine a world without landlords, and uh, the DSA national Twitter account tweeted it out. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, would have would have gotten a big kick out of that. Uh, not that I don't still now, but it would have gotten an even bigger kick out of that, you know, back then. So, uh, all right, all right. So Ryan says there's only one way to settle it. So he did win his bar fight. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, yeah, Ryan says he has a hundred percent bar fight win record <laughs> from his one bar fight. So, uh, see, told you. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what what James' pub record from you know Northern England is, but uh, but in any case, I guess I guess at this point, uh, if um, uh, you know, if there was ever a give them an argument live show, uh, we'll we'll have to have <laughs> both of them in there, and then there'll be like a. Uh, uh, then there'll be a, a bare knuckle boxing, you know, uh, portion of it later. Uh, yes, exactly. Joe Brummer says, I guess we'll have to have a GTA fight night. I will not be involved in this. <laughs> you, could, you could be a color commentator. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, what are your favorite seasons of The Simpsons? Hmm. This is obviously directed at you. Although at this point you could give a much better informed answer than you could have a few years ago. How? Because you've seen so much Simpsons. Since then. Yeah, Ben has shown me many Simpsons, <clears throat> but I have no idea what season they're from. Um, I don't know. Let's see. When was Who Shot Mr. Burns? That was like the end of season uh, five or six or something like that. I think. Uh, and I think that like the the seasons, like like the first season or two of The Simpsons, it's good. I like it, but it's it's doing something a little bit different. It's much more like just a normal sitcom, but animated. Uh, and it's, it's not quite as funny as the stuff that comes after, I think like maybe in season three or so, they really hit their stride, which is not to say there's not funny stuff earlier. And then like, yeah, right up until like, yeah, that like whatever seasons they were doing, the who shot Mr. Birds, that was all great. Uh, the, um, and then, um, then, yeah, I think whichever season uh, Wizard of Evergreen Terrace was in, the one where Homer becomes obsessed with Thomas Edison, 
I think is probably like a good marker for like, all right, by then you could tell it had already started to decline a little bit. Um, like they did a very good and very funny episode, like a season after that called uh, Behind the Laughter, which is a parody of the MTV's Behind the Music. Um, and, but like, it was also part of the reason it was funny is they were kind of self-referentially making fun of like, you know, of how the show had declined. So uh, I don't know if all that adds up to an answer, but that's probably the best one I can give on the fly. On the fly. I prefer Bob's Burgers. Uh, yeah, I like that. Uh, Joshua Prim suggests that, uh, and then Pill Pod, that's the one that uh, Matthew McManus is uh, Mexico Man. Mexico uh, Man. Yeah, we always call him Mexico Man, even though he's a Canadian, and at this point he's been back in Canada for like, I don't know, a year or two. Uh, but so, When I first came to know of him, he was living in Mexico, so he's Mexico Man. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a somebody we knew in Korea who... Um, he like walked past like a zoom window, you know, with like a towel on once. So he's forever afterwards towel man. Uh, I have a hard time keeping track of people when I've never met them. Um, so, so they get these, these nicknames. So Ben will say a name and I'm like, huh? And he'll be like towel man. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so apparently who shot Mr. Burns part one, that was the season six finale. Uh, so anyway, yes, Joshua says, and then pill pod. So the, uh, the podcast that Matt, among other people do, has to do a fight night episode, and it's just an in-depth commentary on the GTA fight. So that, sound, that sounds about right to me. Um, you know, it's funny, Ryan says, if Mark's involved, I forfeit. And, I don't blame you. And I understand why, because, like, Mark actually has done a bunch of martial arts stuff. Although I will say, uh, the one time I did see Ryan and Mark spar, uh, you know, Mark tried to kick him and it did not go well. Um, so um, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, the, no, Hugo is not my favorite character. Let's see, so um, Linda? Well, my favorite main character is Louise. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, my favorite other character is, what is his name, Zeke? Oh, is sure, right? sure, sure, Zeke, yeah. Um, Charles Raintree says Dance and Homer was the first episode to truly cement the characters and plot form. That could be. I mean, I remember that episode. I don't remember exactly when it was. Um, yeah, so E. Dumont has asked a couple of questions about the book club idea. I mean, I wouldn't hold your breath on that, uh, doing like a kind of GTA philosophy book club. Maybe sooner or later, but uh, there are many, many coals in the fire. So, you know. Maybe, but not soon, I would say. Um, although it's a fun idea. It is worth thinking about how that would work if we did it. Maybe we could do that as like a patron thing or something. I don't know. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Jay Hutch says, why is there so much fighting going on with you people? <laughs> um, it's the, I mean, this, this time I'm speaking about is the only time <laughs> that I ever actually saw it happen. Uh yeah, Sam Cedar will be bitterly disappointed, I'm sure, to hear that well. <laughs> uh, someone he's never met, you know, that uh, his character on Bob's Burgers uh, isn't her favorite character. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> would Jen run the GTA book club, maybe? No. <laughs> so. Would I adopt Tina or Jean? I would adopt anyone in the world before I would adopt Jean. Yeah, that'd be annoying. Uh, let's see. <laughs> yes. Ryan says he has better kicks than Mark, so it's a kick fight. He'll stay in. Uh, Andrea says season nine is when Simpsons start to decline. By 12, it's complete garbage. Sounds plausible to me. I watched an episode, uh, like the first new episode or recent episode I'd, I'd seen in, in like many years, uh, like a week ago or so. Um, uh, with my friend Les, uh, it, was the, it was the one, the Morrissey episode, uh, and it's, uh, I mean, it's it's not that it was terrible, but it made me a little sad, let's put it that way, you know, it's like you're, you, you know you're watching a shadow of something that was once great, uh, especially now, because some of the voices are different, it's just weird. It's uh, like watching an athlete in their later years when they should have retired a year ago. Exactly. Uh, let's see. Uh... Would you listen to podcasts to increase the speed? No. Uh, I, I listen to audiobooks. I do. 
Yeah. They, they just sound, they're so slow. They sound too slow at regular speed. And, and I know lots of people who are like less podcasters than like Twitch streamers will do that. Oftentimes when they watch something, they'll like speed it up to get through it faster. Uh, sometimes like in a weird way. So like the people sound, sound like chipmunks. Yeah. For me, it's not about getting through it faster. It was just, they, they sound like they're talking too slow. But that always, I mean, whatever, it's a matter of personal preference, but uh, stuff being sped up always really annoys me. <laughs> no, it's not, cause it always sounds wrong, uh, even if it's not like chipmunk sped up, even if it's just kind of like one and a half speed or whatever. It's like I, something <laughs> somehow viscerally, I don't like that. Uh, Dara says, Family Guy, greater than symbol, The Simpsons. Um, I mean, if you're talking about like now, Maybe, yeah. I mean, I, I I think that might be right. Like, there's probably been less of a decline in Family Guy. I haven't seen Family Guy in forever. Yeah, I actually just recently watched some ones from like, I was gonna say relatively recent, then I realized they're probably from like two thousand and you know nine or something. That was a long you know, time ago. <laughs> it's, it's like yeah, it was a pretty long time ago, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, so Family Guy's probably declined like declined less. Like it's probably closer to what it used to be, but also I'd say. That the Simpsons had a lot further to decline, and like classic Simpsons, way better um, than uh, than Family Guy. Um, like Simpsons when it was starting to decline, yeah, maybe there's a. I'm sure there's a point where Family Guy was probably better. I'd, I'd probably go along with that. Do we'll sit down and have dinner. Ben will turn on an episode of The Simpsons, and at this point, I'm just like, whatever, let's watch it. <laughs> but I, you know, I I don't know what season it's from or. Yeah, Joshua says steamed hams alone uh, blows all family guy out of the water. That's probably right. Um, we'll, we'll watch the episode of this thing later. Uh, I know you're looking forward to it. I can tell. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Jay Hutch says Sam Cedar is glasses man for the record. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to call him that because I can just say Hugo. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Glenn Greenwald is the guy with all the dogs. Yep. Um, yep, dog man. Yeah. Uh, Crystal Ball, she remembers because because I think she thinks it's a prostitute name. Wow, I was just gonna say a memorable <laughs> name, uh, or at least an exotic dancer name. No, not a prostitute name. Definitely an exotic dancer name. Uh, if if my parents named me that, I would be mad at them forever and ever and ever. All right, uh, Crystal, my apologies if you ever watch this. Uh, just saying. I'm sure it's not the first time she's heard that. I'm suggestion. sure it's not. <laughs> and this is my own, um, my opinions do not represent <laughs> Ben's opinions. Let's do that disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Opinions expressed by me are mine alone. Fair enough. Um... Escort. That's what I meant. Not prostitute. There you go. Perhaps escort, definitely exotic things. Uh, Jandra World wants to know, do I have a nickname? No. No, you don't. And I knew you were going to ask that. And uh, and you don't. I yeah. think because Ben calls you Andy all the time, and I always call you Jay Andrew. So yeah. I, I don't know if that counts as a nickname since that's your actual name. But anyway, I'm going to meet you in a couple of weeks anyway. So. Uh, Charles Raintree says Monorail, Lemon of Troy, come on, man. Yeah, th those are two of the absolutely immortal episodes there. Uh, of what? The Simpsons. Um, Andrea says also Futurama is better Futurama. than everything else apart from Top Shape Simpsons, but maybe it's just me. Yeah, man, Futurama is very good. I, I liked it a lot. Uh, let's see. Uh, what do you think of South Park? I haven't seen a South Park in forever. Yeah. Um I thought it was funny. Yeah, I was I always liked South Park. Um like they, they did a um yeah, I mean I, I think I think actually early season South Park was brilliant. Like I mean there was there was stuff that like uh there were particular kinds of jokes that like I thought were kind of gross, so like I, I had <laughs> trouble with those episodes, but like but I, I actually I actually think it was it was a very uh very very funny show and, and i mean the way those put together uh hugo man <laughs> uh, was, uh, was really good and actually i, I haven't seen that much like i pretty i probably stopped watching south park regularly in like 2011 but i watched some of the episodes from the season they did 
you know, give, doing like their version of the 2016 election where Mr. Garrison is a very thinly disguised Trump stand in and he's still running against Hillary Clinton. And, um, uh, and, and I don't know, I, I, I thought in a weird way, like they, they kind of captured the dynamic of the election better than anything else I'd see on TV. Like he does this thing where Mr. Garrison like is terrified because he realized he might actually win and he ought have to become president. So he's saying increasingly insane and offensive things to try to derail his campaign, but people just like him more, you know, after he says them. Uh, so let's see. Pinky and the brain. Ben likes that. Um, yeah, I was. Yeah, I, I, I was, saw one episode of that, and I was like, "What is this?" Yeah, if it, I mean, granted, it probably helps if you like watched it a bunch twenty years ago and have warm memories of it. But, uh, but yes, I like. I that episode was the only time I've seen it since then. But I love picking the brand way back when. Uh, howdy, howdy, friends. Uh, and yeah, Andrea says uh, South Park is one that has declined the least, though it certainly has. That sounds plausible to me. Um, and yeah, I mean, a couple of people commented on the politics of it and it's like, yeah, I mean, it is kind of libertarian, but I mean, I've, I've, I've enjoyed lots of things that represent, um, that come out of like, as far as like art and entertainment literature and all that, I've enjoyed lots of stuff that comes out of points of view that are very, very different from mine. Uh, that's that's not a that's not a requirement. Uh, we would never kick you out, Silver. Uh, ooh. We treasure you uh, as a viewer. Silver says, "Did I get moderated out? I start mm -hmm. getting spinning ball instead of video." Okay, that that is a you problem. That's that's your connection. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's a valued viewer. You do not speak to him that way. Um, yeah, that's a that's a your connection problem. That's that's, that's not <laughs> you're being censored by GTA. Uh, and yes, you are a valued viewer, absolutely. Uh, yes, that was classic uh, from the uh, the World of Warcraft episode of South Park. How can you kill that which has no life? Uh, like you know, you have no life. You know, you're you're spend all your time playing this yeah. game. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Thought I dated one of those. <laughs> You can guess how that went. Uh, Bojack Horseman. Uh, That's a thing Ben watches. Yeah, watch. It's over. But yeah, I, 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 yes, I watched the entire run of Bojack Horseman. I consistently enjoyed that. Um, <laughs> uh, William Mason wants to know if David Feldman was the inspiration for Krusty the Clown. I hope so. <laughs> so that would that would make my day to find that out. Let's see. Um. <laughs> we will not get to Sybil. <laughs> yes, Jay Hush uh, says, I'm glad most of us in this room seem to have grown up in the 90s, judging by the TV show references. <laughs> A few more hours, we'll get to Sybil. Yeah, it is kind of funny. I've, thought, I've had the same thought about uh, Chapa Trap House, uh, which, uh, um, to, to remind, like the names thing, to remind people what Jen, uh, what, uh, Jen what that is. I say, oh, you know, your favorite podcast. I, I know what that is because I can't stand those people. <laughs> yes. I I enjoy Chapo, Jen, not so much, but um, and um, <laughs> but uh, but I remember thinking that at a certain point, it was kind of funny, like that they, there was always all this talk about how um, you know Chapo represented the politics of of like millennials people would specifically say who'd gotten like excited about politics after the Bernie campaign, all this stuff and the humor was appealing to them. But it's like, man, if you listen to that show, you can tell from all the TV references, those, those people are not much younger than I am. Uh, a <laughs> lot of Sopranos talk in, uh, in Chapo, a lot of Simpsons talk in Chapo, uh, you know, et cetera. Let's see. Uh, I read for pleasure. I read for pleasure a lot. I just finished my, I keep a list. I just finished number 86 on the year. I read a lot of YA. Um, I don't read a lot of, of just straightforward fiction. I read a lot of YA and I read, uh, I read, uh, I read nonfiction. I read a lot of stuff about the, the mind and the brain. Um, I love Agatha Christie. I love Sarah Shepard. Yeah, I, I I love Faulkner because 
they're so obnoxious, dude. They're just, oh, they find themselves so hilarious. The they're the, so impressed by themselves. For anybody who's still washing dishes, question was, uh, <laughs> Those are a lot of dishes. Uh, Jen, why do you not like Chapo? And it's it's just, I mean, look, I, I, I do like, I do enjoy the hell out of Chapo, but I also get it. I mean, it's also, it's like some stand-ups that I like. There's this, that, like, there's a sense of humor there that I enjoy, but it, it's not for everybody. Um, no. Uh, Jeeves and Wooster. I love Jeeves. Um, Kathy gave me a Blandings book. I, I need to get into Blandings. I haven't yet. I have a, a big book of all of the Jeeves short stories, which I absolutely love. And the novels. I've read all the novels. I love those. We've been watching the show with uh, with Kathy. Actually, Kathy, you're getting yeah, the, a lot of shout outs the, uh, here. The, the, the Jeeves and Wooster uh, TV show from the BBC, yeah. uh, which is great. Actually, I really enjoy that a lot. Um, yeah, I was I was feeling kind of left out because Kathy was watching whatever she was watching with Ben and she was watching all this other kind of stuff with Dave and brother. And I was like, I don't I'm not watching anything with Kathy. I feel left out. So yeah, this was like Christmas break a few years ago. We were back in Michigan. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think we were. I think I was watching the marvelous Mrs. Maisel uh, with her. Which yeah, is, uh, so was Dave. Which is a you know, which is a fun show. I think that the I think that like the first season was the best, but it's a fun show. So I was feeling left out because she wasn't watching anything with me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Joe Brummer says I'm a millennial slash zoomer, and I listen to Chapo. It's just a lot that goes over my head. Fair enough. <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think of the worst book I've ever read. Oh, oh and I guess I never really answered the uh, the reading for pleasure question. Um, much, much less than I'd like to right now, uh, for obvious reasons. So, um, I did read one. I mean, I think they I actually read the Joshua Cohen's novel, uh, the Netanyahu's, which is very rare because it's the first time in a long time I've, I've read a novel like right after it came out, uh, and I liked that a lot. Um, but yeah, I used, I mean, like a few years ago, I read fiction all the time, right? I mean, like you can see uh, on the shelf just behind me, there are like all of those Philip Roth novels, like 20 of those things, and they uh, like, like I, I used to read that all the time. I have been having trouble. Uh, you're finding the time lately as as you might imagine i mean i've actually started like this you know this year well i and we you know uh some of the, some of them solo lots of them together have started watching more movies again and even that's been great right but like i'd, I'd, I'd really like to go back to reading more novels i, I miss that a ready player one i did not like uh i, I did not yeah, I enjoyed Ready Player One. I don't think it's amazing writer or anything, but it's, it, it was it was it was fun. I liked all the '80s stuff. Um, let's see, uh, do, um, <laughs> yes. Okay, so yeah, Darius says worst book either of you. Yeah, I'm trying to. Sam trying Harris to, books don't count. I feel like there's something I was yelling about not that long ago about how terrible it was, don't but I don't remember. There are a couple books on the Pulitzer fiction winners that were pretty bad. There was one, I don't remember what it was. I think it was called G. It was the the title of it was just a letter, and I think it was G. And that may have been the worst book I've ever read. Yeah, that's tough. Um, well, I guess technically speaking, I could just say, well, okay, Sam Harris books don't count in that case. Uh, the worst book I've ever read is The Right Side of History, How Reason and Moral Purpose Made the West Great by Ben Shapiro. But uh, I think the spirit of the question is uh, excluding, yeah. excluding everything like that. Yeah. Uh, in which case, it's, it's a little tricky. No, 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 no. The Breast by Philip Roth. That is the worst book I have ever read. Yeah. Okay, go on. <laughs> sure you've read books way worse than no that. <laughs> no i have not that g thing i think came close but oh man that was the worst thing i've read yeah um so uh the breast is one of uh so roth has uh 
novels like there's the uh the zuckerman novels which is the most of which are about this guy named nathan zuckerman who's a pretty obvious philip roth stand-in he's a novelist uh and then uh there the uh there are the kepish books about this literature professor david kepish and there are some roth books about fictional character actually named philip roth and you know etc but so this is a kepish book it's a novella it's it's basically a sort of weird like kind of par like ah, parody is the wrong word but it's like a kind of weird take on kafka you know the metamorphosis uh where where, where uh kepish turns into a giant breast uh jen you know who was not absolutely a, horrible who was not a fan she has she has really liked some other philip roth books but not that one um as i mentioned not on philosophy friday but on a i think just random q a stream last year uh, there was a um, there was a when we were leaving Korea, um, you know, the, at the end of uh, well, at the end of the year where we were there together. Uh, oh yeah. I we were uh, sorting books, and you know, uh, Jen mostly reads Kindle books anyway. But the uh, so anything that I can possibly read on Kindle, I do. But I I like. Uh, I like to, um, uh, I like paper better as a general rule. I've warmed up to, uh, to, to Kindle, but I, I still like, I still really like having actual paper books. Uh, Darius, thank you so much for the super sticker. Uh, so, um, so we're going through my books mostly and, uh, and trying to All your books. <laughs> figure out or entirely, uh, and, uh, trying to figure out which ones we could take. Cause we obviously, we did not have room for all of the, the books I built up in years of living in Korea, uh, in, um, to bring back to, uh, to the U S. Uh, and so we, when you took a whole bunch to Korea, I was like, what are you doing? Why are you dragging all these books across the world? So I, 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 I take it a bunch and being a bit of a book hoarder, I, you know, bought more books while I was there and et cetera. So we ended up having to give a ton of them to, uh, the bar, like the, like, a uh, like it's not uncommon for some expat bars in South Korea to have a little shelf of books, uh, that, you know, like sort of take one, leave one kind of library. And, uh, we end up giving a ton of them to, you know, to one of those bars, uh, like, like they have, I think most of the books probably to this day at that bar, you know, are, are books that we donated. And, um, uh, and so you, you donated, stop trying to bring me into this. <laughs> and so we, you know, so I was like trying to separate like the pile of books to donate to the pile mm -hmm. of books to actually take back to the U S and Jen fished my copy of uh, Philip Roth's novel, American Pastoral, out of the books to get to the bar. She was like, what are you doing? You clearly love this book way too much to be separated from it, <laughs> which is yeah. absolutely right. I do. Uh, and it actually goes back to the thing earlier about like how I enjoy lots of stuff that doesn't come out of my, you know, worldview. Because that's, that, that's uh, uh, you know, like that's a book that has a portrayal of 60s radicals that are, it's not, you know, complimentary. But it's 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 just an amazing novel. I love it. Um, Best Stephen King, uh, Salem's Lot, and Christine. Ah, uh, yeah, those are really solid choices. Uh, so yeah, question was obvious, I guess. So um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, Salem's Lot is a really good one. I like Salem's Lot a lot. Um, a book that doesn't give quite as much love as some of these others that I liked a lot um, was uh, Revival, uh, which is a more recent book, although again, probably like 2009 or something, but you know, it's, it's you know, certainly more recent than Salem's Lot, right? <laughs> or, uh, uh, and um, yeah, I actually did read The Midnighters also. Uh, I read another trilogy by Scott Westerfeld the pretties, pretties, uglies, specials. Um, that one, specials. Yeah. yeah, I've never even read these, but for some reason I remember the names. So because I was reading them, were, I was reading those from the library, so they were actual books that you, that yeah. you saw. Um, I do read books from the library. It's not like I don't like to read physical books. It's just that sometimes um, Kindle books are like twelve dollars, and when I could get them from the library, but. Kindle is just so much better. If anyone ever gives me physical books, I'm happy to read them and then I pass them along to somebody else. I don't keep them. So, um, 
but yeah, Revival is really good. I mean, it's it's sort of Lovecrafty in the premise, and it's got a lot of, uh, you know, there's lots of stuff in there uh, about uh, rock music and lots of stuff about sort of people um, thinking and arguing about religion. So there's lots of stuff that panders to my interests, is what I'm saying. It's probably part of why I have probably what part of why I liked it. Uh, but I think I think Revival is one of the best uh, recent ones I've read. I, I re- actually did read, I think, one of his most recent ones, actually recent, like last year or two, uh, uh, later, which was, you know, it was, it was pretty good. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't amazing. Um, I feel like Salem's Lot is just such a... <clears throat> no, Salem, Salem's Lot is... Total cliche answer, but there's a reason for that. Yeah. And at least with Christine, I, I don't know if that's on I'm people's pretty, favorites pretty- list. Yeah. as much so i'm pretty comfortable with that too like this always happens like music conversations that like when people are asking about like favorite albums and stuff it always feels like the rules of the game there's this sort of built-in pressure to be like oh no no, no. actually what i like is this like mm-hmm. really obscure you know under- no it's not it's no like, it's not no uh you know like you're I- not cool just be honest yeah it's like oh yeah no i i really like this you know this this uh you know, under God, John, they did from like 10 years before they became popular. It's like, okay, well, that's nice. I, I, I like the one that they did that was actually became really popular for a reason. Uh, you know, so it's, yep, like, yep. So it's like, I, I'm, I'm pretty, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty basic about stuff like that. You know, I think the, I think the best Stones album is Exile on Main Street. I think the best Nirvana studio album is Nevermind. Um, the uh, you're so basic. Although I do, although I do think the MTV Unplugged uh, one is the uh, is the best. It was actually uh, just uh, texting somebody about that last night in connection with uh, something Daniel Bessner is is doing this uh, music podcast thing with uh, with Nando Vila, I think. Uh, but um... Casual philosophy says my favorite Beatles album. I have to say the best of the Beatles, uh, the, uh, uh, Abbey Road. Uh, I don't have an answer. Would actually be my answer, but there are the Beatles is not one of them. But there are band, there are definitely bands that like I enjoy listening to. But I also like all I really enjoy listening to is the stuff that would be on the best of album. You know, it's like yeah, they did like ten memorable tracks ever. And, you know, they, here they are. Like so. I don't really need to like be a completist about this. You know, I can just listen to that. I have never seen Castle Rock, and uh, we have just been Rickrolled. Ah, very good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Um, I didn't see the movie of Christine. Yeah. Yeah. I actually had the. Oh, Ryan. Uh, Ryan says, what is the best Zeppelin album and why is it physical graffiti? I don't think I agree with that, actually. Well, Well, anyway, back up to what you were going to say about Christine. Oh, yeah. What I was going to, before we do Zeppelin, what I was going to say about Christine is uh, I have not seen the movie version either. Um, I did also like the novel. Uh, We listened to that together, read the audiobook. Uh, Yeah, but I had already read the book. Okay. but I, I had already read the book and then you were some, like, what we were doing it on a road trip. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was like, okay, but yeah, I like the book. Sure. Yeah. It's a good book. I enjoyed it. I, I remember having the thought, so I've not seen the movie that was actually made, but for anybody who's ever watched uh, waking life or scanner darkly, um, the, uh, those movies both do this animation style where it's like i think the way they do is like they, they film people but then they sort of do the animation over and it looks really weird and um anyway i, I thought that like it'd be like i really want link Lauder to do a a movie of christine in that style because i think there's a lot of ambiguity about what's really what's real in that book that would i think lend itself very nicely to to that style of movie but um Moving, moving on to, uh, to to the really important stuff. Hang on a second. Yeah, Rick Astley's great. Uh, you know, I know he's he's that that whole thing is like a joke now, but yeah, he's great. <laughs> um. So, uh, so yeah, I don't think I don't think Physical Graffiti is the best Zeppelin album. I think that it's got some great stuff on it. I mean, Cashmere is one of my favorite Zeppelin songs. Uh, but is the Al and you know, Houses of the Holy the track? You know, I mean, that's also great, but. 
Is the album the best album? I don't know about that. This could go on uh, for hours now. Thanks, Ryan. Like, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the most, I guess I should say Zeppelin IV because that'd be the most basic possible answer. Oh, Charles just gave us that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and it, and it might be, uh, but I don't know. I mean, I think that the, um, like there's stuff that I like on on everything i mean even up until even uh even in through the outdoor which was definitely the most flawed of the studio albums like it i mean still has fool in the rain in it which is a great song and this is after i think um you know i think jimmy page was probably uh you know too too busy uh uh, you know, being a heroin addict to uh, to play the same role that he did played, putting together the other albums, and uh, you know, Bonham was too busy being a not very functional alcoholic, and so, you know, John Paul Jones did the best that he could, uh, but uh, but I, I think it's a very flawed album. But again, Fool in the Rain is a great song, uh, physical graffiti, great stuff on it. Uh, Presence is one that doesn't get nearly enough love. I love Presence. Uh, like Achilles' Last Stand, you know the opening track alone, but like the whole thing, like it's it's a short album, but it's it's very consistent kind of feel to it. And I really love the whole thing. Uh, House of the Holy is is good, although I don't I don't love it as much as other some other people do. Uh, Hang on a second, I need to. I I think G was was a Booker Prize winner. I need to correct myself there. The 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 terrible terrible book. It was a Booker Prize winner. Yeah. Uh, Silver says Cashmere is in fact one of their best songs. You're correct. Uh, Andrea says favorite poem. And when I first saw it, I thought, I, I thought it said favorite person. I was like, well, Ryan, I <laughs> said that before. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, I don't have a favorite poem. <laughs> yeah. Ode upon a Grecian urn. Can I say that? <laughs> if you mean it. Is that what everybody says? <laughs> Is it? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I like the the end of it. Uh, um, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. It's the a, Lady of Shalott. It's a good poem and a good Iron Man song. Uh, so, let's see. I mean, I think, I think, I mean, three's got amazing stuff on it, but I think one, two, and four are all like, I think depending on, I mean, Dazed and Confused has got to be one of my very favorite Zeppelin tracks. Uh, I told you this could take this, hours. Uh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. So we, yeah, uh, we, we, we froze <laughs> there, but, uh, but, We're back. but yeah, I think, I think two or four, depending on, depending on like when you ask me, are probably the main contenders. And even at that, I think I might actually like Pre the presence more than I like physical graffiti. Not, I asked not you, that it's not a great album. I asked you this years and years ago and you said four. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think at various times, you know, most of these I might've said not in through, I think I never would have said in through the outdoor. Um, so it was just the, the time that I happened to ask you. No, I don't know. I, I think that was my go-to answer for years, <laughs> but like, I, I spent too much time thinking about this and, you know, and, and, and now I'm less sure, but. Oh, well, I just assumed that when I asked you and you told me that that was then the answer. No, so I, I think, it, I think it was the answer when, when I. Yeah. But I mean like the know. answer. And <laughs> yeah. I, right. didn't, I didn't well, feel well, like I needed to it's, ask every I mean, year. It's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing <laughs> album. It's a very good answer. If that's the answer. I mean, uh, <laughs> I know people hate on Stairway to Heaven because it's overplayed, but it's an, but it's a great song. I mean, that turn at the end, you know, the shadows longer their souls, uh, the uh, the you know Battle of Evermore is amazing. Oh, it's so much uh, better if you play it backwards, though. <laughs> going to uh, going to California when the levee breaks. I think I might have actually talked myself back into four. So. Um, <laughs> uh, Rush is annoying. That voice, man, can't stand it. I'm not annoyed by Rush the way that Jen is, but I'm I'm not. Like and Megadeth a, also. I'm not same a huge problem. Rush fan. Uh, there, there are. I mean, whatever. I mean, it count uh, Symphony of Destruction. I mean, how can you not like that at least a little? Because it has his annoying voice. <laughs> that's that's how. 
Oh man, poor Dave Mustaine. Uh, well, maybe he should have a different voice <laughs> if he wanted me to like him. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Dancing Circle says Robert Plant's Bluegrass album is top. Not quite. So I'm trying to think because uh, there are a couple of the bluegrass one. I'm not sure I've actually heard this, which is because I know I've, I remember. Are you sure? So do you mean Raising Sands, the one with Alison Krauss or the, uh, the um, Band of Joy album, which is amazing, but I, are those bluegrass? I'm trying to think back to those, those albums. Like I'm, I'm, I actually do like bluegrass a lot, but um, one of my, one of my go-to recommendations, uh, despite my basicness or maybe uh, sort of alongside it, uh, you know, when I re want to recommend uh, music to people that they have. Okay, yeah, Raising Sand uh, is the one is the one he's talking about. Yeah, no, it's a good album. All right, fair enough. I, I don't know why I wasn't immediately thinking of that. But when I want to recommend to people music that they haven't heard before, uh, something I often recommend uh, is a band called Iron Horse that does uh, bluegrass covers of, uh, of, of rock music. So uh, they have, um, they do like bluegrass, Guns and Roses, and et cetera. And uh, one of them is they have a whole album of uh, bluegrass covers of Metallica songs. And man, some of those, like like Unforgiven, you know, Wherever I May Roam, like works. You get my mom to listen to this. Works so well as bluegrass that you would almost think that this was some old bluegrass song that uh, was just, uh, that like Metallica just did a rock cover of. So anyway, uh, I have to say this because it's just so awesome is we're taking my mom to see Metallica in uh, November. In November, We're also taking her to see the Rolling Stones, which we were supposed to do in July of 2020. But then that whole thing happened, but it got rescheduled also to this coming November. But my mom is going to go see Metallica. We have floor tickets. Can't wait. This is going to be my fourth time seeing Metallica. <laughs> I invited Ryan. He said no. Sad. Yeah. Um, even though Greta, Greta Van Fleet is uh, is opening, and I know he's a fan of theirs, but um, yeah, Andy says Allison Krauss is bluegrass for some reason. I think she's more folk or old timey. Okay, this sounds right to me because I remember that album pretty well, and I would not think of that as bluegrass. So I'm I'm actually really happy to have you say that, Andy, because I was like, I remember that album. How did I not think about as the bluegrass album? All right. Uh, I know who Allison Krauss is, but I don't think that I'm qualified to speak on her. Well, in any case, it's a very good album. Uh, there, there are, I mean, it's been long enough since I listened to it that, like, I, I couldn't, like, name the tracks that I really liked off the top of my head. Uh, but uh, there are a couple that I like quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I've listened to a little bit of Ghost. It's, it's, it's kind of like, um, I think it'd be safe to say, trying very hard to be 70s Black Sabbath. Which is not an insult. I love so does Black Sabbath. So, you know, I just mentioned Greta Flan Fleet earlier, you know, which is trying very, very hard to be Led Zeppelin. Uh and you know, it's, I mean, I think it's a I think I think they, they do a decent, you know, some decent hustle there. Uh yeah, Jay Hutch says bluegrass is a specific instrument set up, like it's uh, originally defined genre. Um this I did not know. Yeah, I mean I I mean I, I I really only know it to like, okay, I can certainly recognize, like I think of, um, and again, I like, I like bluegrass a lot or what I think of as bluegrass, which might be a more specific style that not all bluegrass fits into. Uh, but, um, but like, I really love the Sturgill Simpson uh, bluegrass uh, album, uh, Cutting the Grass, uh, which is, which has like, there are songs that are, are country songs that he did that are songs I like, but like the bluegrass versions of them, I actually like way better than the regular country versions. Let's see. Man, it's been a while since we got a question about philosophy on this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we can agree to disagree. Silver says, honestly, though, probably the best Led Zeppelin album would be a best of compilation. Their tracks in every album I'm either okay with skipping or need to skip. Okay, that I do disagree with. Uh, I think that um, there are, I guess, certainly in my case, up, other than in Through the Outdoor, there are definitely tracks that are better skipped on there. Uh, that, like, Hot Dog, whatever that song is, that that's super skippable. But... Um, 
And but like I think yeah I think I think one through four houses the holy uh, presence physical graffiti. I mean, I can very happily listen to all of those straight through. Ben skipping. is very much an album person. I am, and and I think, um, and I think that, I think Zeppelin in particular, like a lot of what makes those. Out, I mean, like it's not just that the tracks are amazing, which they are. It's that the way they're put together, the arrangement on on the albums is really good. Um, I'm much more of a. I like this song. Or if if it's if I am setting out to listen to all of the songs on a, a particular album, I put it on shuffle. Uh, Tadia says the most communist thing I read as a teen was Fanshin by Hinton about the conversion of a Chinese village from feudalism to collective farming. Fair enough. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, Ryan says most of Zeppelin's albums are great from beginning to end, and they hang together so well as albums. Yeah, I strongly agree with that. But especially for some graffiti, I don't know what's especially about it, but I will, I will, uh, I will give. Um, I mean, I've listened to all, except for and through the outdoor. I've listened to all of these straight through many, many, many times. But I also, uh, you know, now I sort of feel like you know, like sitting down. You know, pouring a glass of scotch and listening to uh, listening to physical graffiti straight through to you know, see if see if there's something about it that I'm not remembering. See, but, there's a philosophy question. What was David Hume's favorite Zeppelin album? Well, obviously, David Hume's favorite Zeppelin album uh, would have been Led Zeppelin IV. <laughs> As somebody asked if we had any vinyl, yes, yeah, for him, yeah. Um, I just don't like collecting physical things, you I'd know, be. like books and <laughs> records. And I, I want everything to be, you know, the, my Kindle, very small, very portable, thousands of books on there. So, um, okay, there's actual philosophy question there, but first, uh, actually two philosophy questions. <gasps> uh, but first, I guess, uh, <laughs> Was Frederick Engel's favorite Skinner album? <laughs> I, I, I can't help you out there. I uh, I do like some Leonard Skinner songs, but I I, I don't uh, I, I I can't like geek out about it like some of these other bands that we've been talking about and like you know spend an hour like talking about the virtues and demerits of specific albums. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I like I like some I like some Bob Dylan quite a bit. I mean, again, not 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 necessarily on the level of what we've been talking about but like yeah i mean you know subterranean homesick blues you know it's great you know there, there are uh there are definitely um you know there, there are dylan songs that i like quite a bit uh, even if uh i'm know. into duran duran if anybody cares she she is very very <laughs> much into duran duran uh <laughs> Okay, so uh, Michael, actually, let's let's hold that because I think the first one's going to be a shorter answer. Um, you know, man, this probably goes to my basicness, but uh, but I actually uh, I think I actually like uh, the uh, uh, Californication uh, better than uh, than Blood Sugar Sex Magic. So. That is a great album. Uh, Sorry, but, I'm with Tad. Sure, there. sure. So Jen's with you. Uh, I'm not saying it's not a great album. I'm just saying, like, in terms of my actual musical pleasure, like, what I'm more likely to listen to stuff from at any given time. Silver, we will get to that. Um, yeah, we you're will, not losing me. We will get to. <laughs> we will get to Silver's question, but uh, all right, uh, Andrea. Philosophy question says: Do you adhere to a deflationary theory of truth? Yes. Uh, so. Um, so philosophers, uh, when they argue about uh, how, what truth is, there are all these views, like, um, which, uh, you know, 90s kids will immediately think of, you know, Bill Clinton, and depends on what the definition of is, is. Uh, but, um, but yeah, theories of truth. Uh, so whether what it means to say something is true is that it corresponds to, uh, to the facts, uh, or that it is coheres together with a bunch of um, other beliefs that perhaps 
our beliefs that we would hold if we were maximally well informed about everything we could ever we could ever learn. That's like one sort of pragmat you know version of like a pragmatist theory of truth. Uh, and and there are a bunch of others. Uh, the but the deflationary theory of truth uh, says what it means to say, for example, um, there's there's nothing that you're doing something other. I want to be really careful about this. Um, I, I don't I don't want to get a you know there are a couple of people who watch this who who might send me a note you know if, if I if I oversimplify it, but. Uh, uh, deflationary truth theories of truth roughly say that we're kind of making a mistake if we think of truth or falsehood as properties of statements that like this is a thing about that statement that it's true that instead we're doing something like and the devil's in the details there are different versions of this we're not going to do a deep dive but the uh, instead what we're doing is something like just expressing agreement with the statement when we say, oh, that's true. So uh, roughly the thought is that when I, um, you know, if you say, uh, I mean, the classic example is like snow is white, right? Uh, that, uh, so deflationist says, you kind of said everything there is to say about the subject. If you say snow is white is true, if and only if snow is white. So um, so if, if Jen says something, I say, yeah, that's true. Uh, that that's just kind of a way of me quickly saying whatever Jen just said. So that's that's roughly what deflationary theory of truth is. And actually, the book that I just finished uh, revising, uh, which is a book that uh, I, I've been working on revising for a hilariously and tragically long time, a lot. Since 1953. Yeah, a lot has happened since 1953, or perhaps more relevantly since, I don't know, uh, so summer of 2019 i think it's how long i've been working on revising this thing uh but uh logic without gaps or gluts how to solve the paradoxes without sacrificing classical logic the deflation gluts. yeah i know jen doesn't like that word gluts. Uh, but it is the word people use in the literature so gluts. there we go uh that i think um what i have to say about the liar paradox and stuff like that heavily depends on what I just said about truth. So there you go. Um, all right. Uh, slightly more in-depth philosophy question. Uh, there's uh, Michael says, I read half that Philippa foot paper you recommended. You said uh, you thought about it often. What kind of thoughts did spark? So the Philippa foot paper uh, that I said is one of the uh, best papers I've ever read about moral philosophy and that I think about a lot is morality as a system of hypothetical imperatives. And um, just trying to think what the quick version of this is. Um, so, you want to do a uh, difference between hypothetical and categorical imperatives? No. All right. That's been a long stream. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, Kant makes a really big deal about the idea that moral imperatives aren't just hypothetical imperatives. Like, if you have some goal, you should do this thing to help advance the goal. In a hypothetical imperative, it's very easy to understand where that should comes from. That the should, the force of the should comes from how much you care about the goal. That, um, you know. That's good. That's good. Okay, we'll, 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 leave, we'll leave that part there. So then Kant makes a very big deal saying that moral imperatives are not like that. They're categorical. Kant doesn't care about your feelings. <laughs> Exactly. Facts don't care about your feelings and neither does Immanuel Kant. Uh, so, um, uh, so yes, um, Kant said, uh, when Kant says moral imperatives are categorical, uh, saying they're not relative to any goal, that the, the force of the should doesn't come from how much you care about the goal. Uh, it, it, it binds you uh, regardless of your goals. And what Philippa Foot is doing in that paper is sort of trying to really explore what that could mean or what could, like, it's not just about Kant, but it's about like a much broader thing about how the way a lot of philosophers think about morality. And she's trying to figure out whether in a really basic way it makes sense. And so I, I guess what it makes me think about 
Uh, anybody who's read Give Them an Argument uh, knows that I, I love my David Hume, uh, you know, about facts and values. And, and I think that, that Hume and Foot, uh, I think, put together. Um, human foot. Gives you a human foot. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think. This has been a long stream. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think that um, so I think that I think the thought the thoughts that sparks are about like what it could mean to say that moral imperatives are binding you, like what 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 it is that we're talking about there, and how bad it would be if ultimately it's just a matter of look, I really care a lot about you know fairness and compassion or whatever, and there's nothing that's like a. Um, you know, there's there's no larger sense in which you know the universe has to share my values for them to be important to me or something like that, right? So, um, this could easily be like three hours on that, but that's that's and and I'm not even necessarily endorsing any particular conclusion about all that, but uh, that's why I think it's such an interesting paper. And also, Foot is again a good writer. All right, let's see. Um. Uh, Ryan Lake disapproves of me for uh, for saying that I uh, tend to prefer uh, Californication to blood sugar sex magic. Again, I'm not saying it's better. <laughs> I'm saying that as a matter of fact, I I'm more likely to you know go back and you know listen to to some of that stuff uh, again uh, again more. Um, Excellent. Jay Hutch uh, has learned something from the stream. He says, I will say that all this talk about Led Zeppelin has explained why you prefer the Stones over the Beatles. Yeah, I mean, I think that, sure. I'm, I don't know why people like the Beatles. We, we could just leave that there. Oh, uh, we will just leave that there. I probably, as I said, I like Abbey Road. I probably like, I probably like the Beatles more than Jen does, but I, I like the Stones a lot more than I like the Beatles. Um, and I like, you know, the Stones and Zeppelin... I like a lot uh, those and Ozzy and not uh, yes Ozzy. Both. We were at trivia the other night, and there was a trivia question, and the answer was Ozzy, and I knew it, and he didn't. Do you remember what the question was? Yeah, it was the who sang, who who sang a duet with Lita Ford. Oh yeah, that's well after the uh, the Ozzy era that I know anything about, but uh, I'm guessing. Uh, excuses, excuses. Yeah, but no, I, I love I love Ozzy era Sabbath, um, and uh, and I also like quite a bit of of especially his early solo stuff. Um, the uh, the the ranking, um, you know, which is kind of funny because we just talk, finished talking about the Philip the foot thing, but to uh, uh, so it's like all right, well, you know, whatever the uh, relationship is between. You know, moral values and and uh, and something that's objectively true. It's probably a lot more tenuous to say there's a relationship between musical values and, uh, and what's objectively true. But uh, but pretty but playing that game and pretending there is, I, I think the ranking goes: um, uh, Ozzy era Sabbath, then Ozzy solo, then Dio solo, then Dio era Sabbath. So. Uh, Dio rocks, man. I enjoy Dio. All right. Uh, I finally gained E. Demont's approval by liking Duran Duran. Uh, e. Demont says, Ordinary World by Duran Duran is a great song. You're all right, Jen. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I have listened to so much more Duran Duran. All right, Ben. In years that I've been <laughs> with Jen than in the entirety of my life before that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, this was this was so bad. Dara said the Harris versus Peterson truth episodes popped in my head, triggered my PTSD. Uh, it's the first time Jordan Peterson went on Sam Harris's podcast. It, it's the single time I've I felt the most sympathy for Sam Harris because Peterson was explaining his view about truth, which is like um, things are true, like it it's only true if they contribute to the survival of humanity or something like that, and. Uh, and Harris was trying to, like, explain why that doesn't really make sense. So he was like, okay, well, what if you have, like, a chemical weapons lab and there's a leak and it wipes out the entire human race? That doesn't mean the theory of chemistry you were working with is false. <laughs> and it's such a simple point. And, and, and Peterson just spends, like, an hour and a half not getting it. And, um, and it, it just, like I said, I felt for him. Like, it, it was like 
it was it was like Harris was a long suffering like underpaid adjunct professor, and um, and Peterson was the world's most confused undergraduate. That was like the vibe of that conversation. Uh, ben does not play an instrument. No, I mean I took piano lessons as a kid, uh, and um, I very very briefly tried to learn how to play the guitar as a teenager, but you know I, I did not stick with that. Um, for, uh, for better or for worse, uh, you know, my, uh, standing joke is always that the, uh, that I only ever really got two chords down and my understanding is you need at least three to be a rock star. So ever since then I've been doing that, you know, plan B activities. Uh, let's see. We talked once about whether I would, I think on here about whether I would support you if you, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, he's talking about when Jesse Lee Peterson was demanding that I tell him where logic comes from. And uh, so we did a poll and then we, uh, Michael read it on TMBS, read out the results. I think the, uh, you know, some of the, some of the, some of the potential answers, uh, I won't, I won't repeat on a family friendly program like Philosophy Friday, but the one that ended up winning was Allah is, uh, is where logic comes from. Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Jen is sticking doctor. Uh, let's see. Ben gets Duran Duran, Jen gets 7 Eleven dates. <laughs> <laughs> so, absolute misrepresentation of what happened there. <laughs> Do not suggest that we go on a date to 7 Eleven. No, you didn't even suggest it. You just tried to take me. Like, I was going to be well, like, Well, because I, th I thought you meant let's pick up some ice cream for on the way. No, back. I meant let's go get yeah, ice cream. I understand that now. And I think after I, dinner, as we were walking. In the moment, I didn't understand that's what you meant. Um, yeah. Even so, who gets their ice cream from 7 Eleven? It was right there. All right. And we got some, and it was terrible. Yeah, Silver says the flip side of Sgt. Pepper's is straight up genius, and as a bonus, it laid the groundwork that even made much of the music by bands like Led Zeppelin even possible. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's true, but I think the question here is well, either enjoyment or quality which either way, no matter how you read it, is a different question from historical importance. Sure. Like, like, there could be lots of music that was like really important because it was innovative and it laid the groundwork for better music later. You know? but, yeah, which I, which I totally see at, um, as part of Beatles, but like just enjoying listening to it now. Yeah. Yeah, I think the white man was one of the options in the, uh, in the poll. Um... Let's see. Um, all right. Got some questions about Isaiah Berlin, uh, the Kinks, New Order, Joy Division. Uh, and you got to ask me more, uh, you know, more hard rock. If, uh, if You know I, Isaiah Berlin. Yes, I understand. Okay. <laughs> Isaiah Berlin is not a musician. Uh, I, I got it sidetracked from the Isaiah Berlin part. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, come on, you know, I, I don't know this Isaiah Berlin person <laughs> asked, asked me about hard rock or at least blues, you know, uh, classic country, you know, I, I, I can deal with all these categories, I don't know what Isaac, I, no, Isaiah Berlin, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like some of those essays, I haven't read that many of them, uh, all right, I think this has been much longer than usual, for sure, uh, should we, get into the uh, the format change and then they call it a night. Absolutely. All right. So uh, for uh, not as good as these other bands, but the doors, but the doors are fun. I like, I like the doors. Um, so. All right. Uh, so next Friday, we are going to be at a memorial service kind of thing out of state. Uh, and then, the Friday after that, we are going to be in the middle of moving to uh, moving back to Georgia, um, and then uh, the Friday after that, uh, we are going to be in California for my brother's wedding. Party! 
So, um, so there wouldn't be Philosophy Friday the next few weeks anyway. But also uh, at the end of the month, um, we are going to be – so the show as a whole is, is going to be on break for a couple weeks uh, between, you know, There we, there we go. are. Uh, so I show, fixed it. The show as a whole is going to be on a break for a couple of weeks between my brother's wedding and uh, Labor Day. Uh, don't want to make anybody work on Labor Day. Uh, so, uh, the, and there have been some format changes that we've been talking about. And so, figured that'll be a, a good time to kick them in. Call uh, the second Monday of September, uh, season three, episode one. Uh, and. Um, there, um, there might be, um, uh, so there, there might be a new, a new face in the, in the regular <laughs> crew for, uh, for Monday night at that point. Uh, and, uh, thank you for the super chat, Strom. I do not know what Jesse Lee Peterson's take on Althusser is, but uh, that'd be fun to ask. Um, so apparently it was my fault that we froze, <laughs> but then I brought it back with my voodoo. So there we okay. go. Uh, so yeah, there might be a new face uh, in in the regular crew on Monday night, uh, and that's so that's one change that there might be at that point. But then uh, another change is that uh, right now um, the way things have been, uh, we are you know I am on YouTube uh, four nights a week. Uh, ben is consolidating. Yes. To pursue other opportunities that have come his way. That was a very corporate HR way of putting that, but it is accurate. Uh, yeah. So um, there are uh, other upcoming commitments, other things that I want to, you know, I want to be doing. Uh, so I am going to have to consolidate the number of nights of the week that I'm on YouTube. Uh, and so. Also, you might want to hang out with your wife every now and then. I guess. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, so the Monday night show isn't going anywhere. That's, 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 that's staying exactly where it is. Uh, the Sunday night breakdown, uh, the Sunday night debate breakdown, um, you know, we're still going to do that, but it's probably going to move to Thursday night. Um, that does mean there might be some overlap with this revolution, which I don't like, uh, that, uh, cause, uh, so you decided on Thursday rather than Wednesday? Well, the problem is Wednesday would be an overlapping with Left Reckoning. And uh, we, we actually, we actually <sighs> start much. start at the same time as Left Reckoning, whereas This is Revolution starts a little later in the night anyway. Oh, so people will be watching you and not so, them. So that's all right. Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's tricky. There aren't enough nights of the week and we end up overlap with somebody no matter, no matter when we do it. Uh, too many people are doing too many things on YouTube, um, including too many friends of mine, but, uh, but any case, so I'm pretty sure it's going to, the Sunday night debate breakdown is going to become the Thursday night debate breakdown, um, at, at the beginning of uh, September. And instead of philosophy Fridays, this is what y'all are waiting for. When do we get Jen? Yes. Instead of Philosophy Friday as a separate stream on Friday night, uh, since we're just doing the two regular scheduled nights and every once in a while breaking news stream or something. But uh, uh, so instead of being a separate stream on Friday night, uh, uh, we are going to be doing, uh, Jen is going to be coming on to do a philosophy segment with me as part of the regular show. Is on, this a demotion or a promotion? Oh, definitely promotion. You made it to the major leagues. You're on the main show now. I'm thinking on Monday night. Uh, <laughs> but I won't be a co-host. I'll just be a guest, right? Uh, so you know, it's it's a. I think a contributor. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know. That's I, th I think that's I think that's what I was called for the the deep plugs on TMBS. I don't know. Uh, can, <laughs> I'm the wife. Use whatever, <laughs> what I am. <laughs> use whatever word you want to use. But we're going to be doing the same thing. I'm that we the do. doctor, Mrs. Doctor. That's what I am. You know, we're going to be doing the same thing that we do on Philosophy Friday, but we're going to be doing it as part of the main show on uh, on Monday night. Uh, so uh, we are still in discussions about exactly where that's going to. I be. expect to see all of you there: <laughs> Jay Hutch, Charles Silver. <laughs> yes. I know Jay Andrew will be there. Yeah. Um, Ryan. <laughs> so, uh, 
it's going to, um, yeah, so it's going to be a little. Um, <laughs> I Hey, yeah, I should get my own intro music. Well, if then we can find something that sounds like Duran Duran, it's going to provide copyright problems. Uh, it sounds like Duran Duran. Yeah. Something Duran Duran y. Whoever does the music, get on that. <laughs> All right, Cole, you heard what the lady said. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah. Um, so, we're still trying to figure out where the philosophy segment is going to fit in, but there is going to be a philosophy segment with Jen as, uh, as part of the main show. Uh, somebody asked, by the way, earlier, I've long since lost where it was in the chat, whether I was still doing Outlaws and Revolutionaries, which is the segment uh, that I was doing all uh, last year with uh, David Griscom. Um, and um, and the answer... Uh, ben sure did pursue me. There we go. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, Actually, that's not true, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so yeah, the answer is that uh, basically, as I think, I think when David got vaccinated and moved back to Austin, uh, he started, uh, you know, actually going out a lot more, and uh, and and so um, his his YouTube availability decreased. Uh, so that's why it hasn't been a um, uh, like it hasn't been a regular weekly segment anymore. You know, like it was up until I don't know, sometime in early twenty twenty one. Uh, I have thought about trying to bring it back as like a once a month thing or something. It's possible. I mean, I did really enjoy doing that segment with him, but um, but in any case, it's it's not. Gonna, I'd, I'd be very surprised if it comes back as like a full, as like a full like weekly thing, like it was all that time. All right, um, I think that this is a good place to finally call it. Or you could mention our other thing. That we do now. The other thing we do now. Gotta give We're on Instagram. Yes. Uh, so um, <laughs> at uh, Ben and Jen. Yep. Uh, so or Ben Burgess. Yeah. If you just search for Ben Burgess on Instagram, but the uh, but the actual at is Ben and Jen. Uh, so uh, this was uh, this is Jen's idea. Uh, although we both post to it uh, the. Uh, you know, so I don't know. I, I guess, uh, you know, it's it's going to be, well, it has been already. We've had it for like a week, you know. It's uh, some, so there's going to be like some GTA related content there. Not much. Yeah, so I. I it's going to be basically J. Andrew's thumbnails. Yes. Otherwise, it's going to be photos, videos, um, personal life stuff. So, uh, and there is already some of that there. So, you yeah, know, you can go check that out. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, all right. Uh, so, uh, if you follow us on Instagram, we'll follow you back. Fair enough. Jay Andrew follows us. Yeah, what else go. do you need to there know? There you go. You want to be cool like him? And Ryan, Ryan also follows us. And I'm sure some of y'all follow us, and I just don't realize it. Yeah, so. <laughs> Jay Hutch says, boy, this is really going to clear up my schedule, too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not reading that. <laughs> that other thing we do now, Ben's thinking she can't possibly mean go to 7-Eleven. <laughs> nope, no, I do not. <laughs> Well, <laughs> <laughs> on that note, yeah, on that note, yeah. So, um, so I think it should be good. I mean, even though this means that um, you're only seeing me for, uh, let's see, the main sh on Monday between the main show and the post game for patrons, that's uh, three hours. Um, Thursday night, you know, whatever night the debate breakdown is, that's like two or three hours. And then uh, there's also patrons get a, uh, a bonus episode every week. So that's like another hour. So, um, so I guess this does mean that you'll now uh, only get to see me on YouTube for, uh, you know, at least if you join the Patreon uh, for, uh, for like six or seven hours a week. 
Uh, so I know this is going to be a difficult loss for some of you uh, that, you know, you might need grief counseling. <laughs> there is a cat in the background. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> He's fine. He just likes to wander around a meal. Yeah. Um, our bag says needs uh, needs more Ben and Doug. Yeah. So uh, Doug has been a guest on. Uh, before. That's B regs. B regs. Not our, our bags. Oh yeah. I had that the other way around. I was probably thinking our bag. I know. Yeah. I, yeah. So, uh, yeah. That's, uh, yeah. So, uh, Doug, uh, my editor at Zero Books and the host is Zero Squared, a good friend. So, he uh, has been on before. I was on uh, Zero Square pretty recently, and Doug will most definitely be on again in the, uh, in the near future. All right. Uh, for real this time, uh, <laughs> gonna, uh, uh, gonna call it, uh, call it a night. Thank you, Jay Andrew. Um, yeah, Andy says he has some royalty-free music for Jen's segment, so uh, outstanding. Uh, this is um, uh, yeah every week for a very long time. Uh, Hi, Shabazz. Uh, Michael would ask me, you know, uh, whether I was ready for uh, uh, Shabazz is the ca the cat's name. Uh, so Michael would always ask me if I was ready for my song because there were actually two versions of the debunk song. Uh, that, that were uh, so there was one that was made by uh, Mundo Mundo uh, I think is how you say that uh, who uh, a TMBS fan obviously and he co-hosts his own show now I've been on it uh, and uh, uh, so that was the original one and then there was one that uh, uh, Napoleon the legend uh, who uh, who's a uh, up and coming like but like actually like pretty um significant you know rapper uh made that one um but uh <laughs> uh yeah silver says she was searching he was searching through the house to see what was up with uh, his roommate's cat uh so his tail is stuck under my arm yeah <laughs> um so anyway so michael would always ask me uh if i was ready for my song and like the joke was always that like like I felt slightly awkward listening to the song about myself. So it's like, you know, it's like, oh, are you ready for your song? It's like, uh, yeah, sure. You know, <laughs> which, which I do feel bad. I think Mundo might have thought that meant I didn't like it, you know, <laughs> but uh, you know, it was just a shtick. But um, but anyway. I would love a song about me. Yeah, there you go. About rock. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so uh, for uh, for real, for real this time. Uh, we are going to uh, to finally uh, call it uh, call it a night. Uh, coming up uh, on uh, Sunday, I'm actually not sure if it's going to be a breakdown on Sunday. I'm going to go on Kenzo Shibata's show, and that ends at eight thirty. Usually, we try to start everything at eight. We might do one if it's like a short debate. We can start late, or we might have to skip this week. I'm not entirely sure yet. But um, on um, uh, Monday, uh, Lillian Sixchera is going to be on, uh, going to talk about her, uh, her, uh, philosophical paper that she wrote about class, uh, and, um, the, um, and the, uh, Monday, actually, I'm not hundred percent sure if we're, if I'm going to be on YouTube, uh, next Wednesday, because, you know, depending on for that memorial service type thing, it, depending on whether we try to do the whole drive in one day or two. We have so much going yeah, on. Yeah, uh, might have to skip that. But the following Monday, Daniel Bestner and Derek Davison are going to be on, talk about their new show, uh, American Prestige. Uh, so uh, that is going to, uh, that's uh, that's going to be good stuff. Uh, really looking forward to that. Um, thanks everybody who uh, stuck with us this long. Left is best. Team Snoopy forever. <laughs> <laughs>